It was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bull and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning to you. It is six o'clock on Friday, the 22nd of March. You will talk today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. The US on a peace mission. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel today as he pushes for a sustained and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. A playful update or a woke agenda? Sir Keir Starmer blasts England's new football kit over a multicoloured redesign of the St George's Cross. And the Waspies fight back. Millions of women born in the 1950s could receive thousands of pounds in compensation after missing out on state pension changes. And temperatures topped 18 degrees Celsius earlier this week. But if you thought spring had arrived, I'm afraid you're wrong. It turns colder this weekend with showers. A very good morning to you. It is time for all the headlines now with Miranda Shunker. Thank you. Good morning. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visits Israel today and says there must be a sustained ceasefire in Gaza. The main sticking point remains that Hamas says it will release hostages only as part of an agreement that would end the war, while Israel says it will discuss only a temporary pause. Well, it comes the need as witness for an immediate sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. Uh, that would create space to surge more humanitarian assistance, to relieve uh, the suffering of many people, and to build something more enduring. Well, it comes as witnesses said Israeli forces had escalated their operation around Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, carrying out a number of airstrikes. Footage released by Hamas military wings shows fighters targeting Israeli tanks around the area. The Home Secretary has vowed to crack down on spiking, as he said perpetrators will be held to account by changes in the law. James Cleverly said the government is updating legislation to make it clear that spiking is a crime. What we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls and the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. An NHS consultant working at the hospital where Lucy Letby murdered seven babies says another scandal is almost guaranteed if whistleblowers aren't given better protection. Dr Ravi Jayaram is backing an independent office of the whistleblower which would provide more effective safeguards. Sir Keir Starmer has told The Sun that he thinks Nike should recall England's official kit for Euro 2024. Appearing on the first episode of a brand new weekly politics show, Never Mind the Ballots, the Labour leader slammed the FA and Nike for changing the unifying St George's flag. A 270 million year old amphibian species has been named after Kermit the Frog. Scientists in the US looked at the remains of an inch long fossilized skull with large and oval shaped eye sockets. They say they've called the creature Kermitos Gratos because Kermit is a modern day amphibian icon. Well, those are the headlines for now. I'll have another update in an hour. <laughs> That's a splendid story. It looks well, nothing I, like Kermit. I'm not seeing it. I think I need my glasses on this morning. <laughs> Kermitus. Uh, what, a, what a brilliant name. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um,
Lots of controversy this morning, as you heard in the headlines about the New England football shirt, the redesign with the multicoloured St George's cross on it. Want to know what you think about it today? Uh, it's been criticised at Nike, have been criticised for changing up the colours of the cross for the flag. Uh, do you think they should change it back to the traditional colours? Even Sir Keir Starmer has been getting involved in that debate. Yes, We'd like he, you too, too. He certainly has. Also, Rishi Sunak has made it one of his top priorities to stop the boats as the general election approaches. Now, yesterday, 500 migrants crossed the English Channel into this country. The number now tops 4,000. The question we're asking this morning, given the highest number came in yesterday, is this another dent in Rishi Sunak's plan? What does it do for his electoral prospects? You can get in touch with us at talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talk.tv. Or you can text us, text the word talk, plus your message to 87 trouble too. We look forward to hearing from you. We certainly do. Let's move on to our top story this morning and the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will return to Israel today in hope of reaching a sustained and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Blinken began a tour of the Middle East holding talks with Arab leaders in Saudi Arabia yesterday. Well, joining us now with all the latest on this is foreign editor for Jewish News, Yotam Konfino. Good morning to you, uh, Yotam. Uh, Antony Blinken, I think it's his sixth uh, visit to the region, uh, gave a, a news conference yesterday, and there's certainly a shift in the language from the United States, isn't there? What do you think his mission is with this latest visit? <clears throat> well, I think it's an expression of the negotiations between Hamas and Israel not really going well. We all know that there are certain gaps between Israel and Hamas, and that hopes aren't really high on either side to reach a ceasefire. So now the United States is stepping in for the first time since the war with its own draft resolution of a uh, calling for a ceasefire. And, of course, it's linking it to the release of hostages. And it's, of course, us also supporting uh, the diplomatic efforts to reach a ceasefire. But it is a sign that the United States is also growing tired of this situation and that it's now trying single-handedly to to um, to enforce the ceasefire, but we have to remember that even if the United States Security Council uh, votes and agrees on agrees on this resolution, it doesn't mean that Hamas and Israel will abide by it. Certainly not Hamas. So this is symbolic, I would say, but it does um, it does express a shift in attitudes from the United States towards, especially Israel. And, of course, the United States is absolutely paramount in this in terms of the relationship with Israel. I think you're absolutely right. It shows a shift in policy from the United States, saying that actually what they want is a sustained ceasefire and immediate ceasefire. Also, when you look at the deal that we think is being proposed, they're going to propose that the Palestinian Authority would be put back into control. This is something that Benjamin Netanyahu has consistently said he does not want to see happen. Not only Netanyahu, no, very few Israelis would like to see the Palestinian Authority take control of Gaza, and certainly the Palestinians do not want them. So we know that the United States has its own uh, blueprint, its own plan as to how to resolve the war. It wants, of course, an immediate ceasefire. But it also wants the Palestinian Authority to take control of Gaza. Now, it can, it can wish and want that, but at the end of the day, that's not what's going to happen. At the end of the day, it will be up to Israel and Hamas to find out who's going to win or lose this war. I think what's important to mention here is that the United States has still not threatened Israel, at least not officially, with withholding military arms if Israel continues its war in Gaza, especially if it goes into Rafah. It hasn't done that yet. What has happened, however, is that Joe Biden told Netanyahu to send a team to Washington to discuss an alternative to a ground offensive in Rafah. Now, why is that important? It's because it's all about rhetoric. If the United States, uh, have, if they're going to support Israel in its uh, military, military operation in Rafah, there has to be rhetorically a change from what Netanyahu has said he's going to do and from what the United States will back. In other words, it can't back a full-scale invasion of Rafah, but it can change the semantics around how you describe this military operation. So that's what's happening right now behind the scenes. Britain, though, is threatening to cut off Israeli arms supply, isn't it? Threatening uh, an arms embargo unless Israel allows more aid into Gaza. A very strongly worded letter from the Foreign Secretary uh, David Cameron uh, this week saying that Israel is responsible for the delays in aid getting through. It's not about a lack of aid, 
it's about it being held up, some aid, British aid, being held up for three weeks at the border. And again, another example, isn't it, Yotam, of this very much toughening of the language, a hardening of the stance? Not only toughening of language, but also disagreement about facts. Israel pushed back uh, on David Cameron's accusation and said, we aren't holding up the aid deliberately. We're doing it because we need to screen all these trucks. We need to make sure that there aren't weapons and other things that could go, that could fall into the wrong hands in northern Gaza. And it said, in fact, every day we screen more than 40 trucks in those two checkpoints that David Cameron is referring to in, uh, on the border to northern Gaza. So they aren't even agreeing on the facts at this point. And that's Elon Levy, also worrying. The, the... Elon Levy, the spokesperson uh, for the Israeli government, has been suspended, hasn't he, for pushing back against David Cameron? And ironically, Israel is doing exactly what Elon Levy did. So you could speculate what's actually behind the suspension. That's a whole other story. But Israel is exactly doing what Elon Levy did this morning, uh, in fact. Uh, the authority that's responsible for aid coming into Gaza said, David Cameron, that is not true. So, um, again, uh, facts cannot even be agreed upon between two close allies, which I think is extremely worrying. So, so let's just go back to this proposed deal. We talked about the Palestinian authorities. Also, we believe the United States is going to push for all parties to believe in a two-state solution. Again, something Netanyahu has consistently said will not happen under his watch. But also, Saudi Arabia would normalise relationships with Israel. That would unlock American arms. And this was what prompted the conflict at the beginning beginning was the deal that was about to be done between Saudi and Israel, which, of course, Iran was opposed to, and Iran sponsors many of those terrorist groups. So how does this, how does this actually come into play? How will they achieve any kind of breakthrough when Netanyahu has been so entrenched in his opinion? Well, we know that the United States is hoping for elections. Chuck Schumer made that very clear. If the United States does want, not want to see Netanyahu continue, and you're being in power. That's one thing. So they're hoping that sometime this year there'll be called new elections and Netanyahu will certainly lose if elections are held. So that's one thing. But also, even if, let's say, that there's a new government in place in Israel that agrees to a two-state solution, that doesn't mean that the Palestinians want a two-state solution. We often forget to ask what they actually want. And the most recent poll that came from the Palestinians show that, once again, a majority of Palestinians oppose a two-state solution. So we're talking about uh, the international system, and I've been saying this for a couple of months, we're talking about an international system trying to uh, push or, or force something on two parties that they don't want. It's interesting that they aren't listening to what exactly the Israelis or the Palestinians want. It's not just Netanyahu's fault. You could blame him for many, many things. He opposes a two-state solution. So does most of Israelis, and so does uh, most of most of Palestinians. Uh, Yotam, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. That's Yotam Confino from Jewish News UK. Let's now take a look at some of this morning's front pages. The Times reports that one million more people have blamed mental health battles as a reason for being on long-term sick leave, making it the leading cause of disability in working age adults. Pay them what they're owed, demands the Mirror, as the paper says women left out of pocket by pension age rises must get payouts. And Kit hits the fans, blast the sun. <laughs> I had to be careful how I said that one. Uh, as the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, slams a New England football strip, not only for the alterations to the St George's Cross, but also for the high price tag too. Well, staying on that topic, there has been widespread outrage at what Nike is calling a playful update to the Cross of St George. On the New England football kit, this is. Speaking on the Sun's new politics show, Never Mind the Ballots, Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, thinks the kit maker... Got it wrong. Um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unified, it doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. All right. I'm not even sure they can properly explain, explain why they thought they needed to change in the first place. Well, we're joined now by Talk TV's political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and former Labour special adviser, Paul Richards. Alicia, plenty of people are completely outraged by what Nike has done to the Cross of St George. We were talking about this earlier, actually. For many of us, we want to fly the flag of St George with great pride. It is the symbol of England. But, of course, many people feel they can't do that. Nike is having a playful update on that. I mean, it's sacrilegious, isn't it? I mean, definitely. I have to admit, I'm not a football fan. And when I first heard this story, I was a bit like, really? Is this really important? But I think that totally just 
dismisses the fact that for lots of people, flying the flag of Britain is a really important thing. Of it's England. patriotism of England, of Britain. I'm just, so that's not just correcting you. <laughs> it's true. That just shows how little I know about football. Um, <laughs> well, it's not just football, that's the point. It, it is, and I think, especially when it comes to sports, I think a lot of people feel really, really strongly about representing our country, and they think that this just totally disguises what we are standing for. I mean, when I saw the new flag, I didn't even know that it was meant to be a flag. It doesn't look anything like the, the current flag of England. So, so I do get where people's frustration lies. I think in that whole interview, Keir Starmer was very much just trying to seem very kind of normal, very human, very relatable. And I think that was definitely part of it too. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because this was on a new programme uh, last night. He was sitting in uh, your seat. Right here. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. Alicia. <laughs> and um, wide ranging interview with Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, talking about the kit, um, but also talking about trust. Mm. Questions from Sun readers, and the majority of those questions were all about how can we trust you? You've changed your position so many times on Jeremy Corbyn, on Brexit, uh, for example, on the 28 uh, million. What, how was Keir Starmer, how did he come across? How did he answer that to his well, critics? I think this whole interview was, he was really, really trying to just assert himself as a kind of man of the people. He was trying to be, come across a bit more relaxed than he maybe has done in, in other broadcast interviews. It was a bit more of an informal conversation. Lots of the questions asked were a bit more, a um, bit less kind of political and more just trying to dig a bit deeper into Who is this as man? a person. Mm. Mm. And I, I think as a whole, it actually, he came across pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think lots of people were quite happy with his responses and lots of people felt that he actually did quite well and just seeming quite relaxed. I think sometimes he gets a lot of criticism for turning up to interviews and being a bit rigid and having very kind of prepared answers mm. and I think yesterday he did an okay job in, in, in trying to quell those those arguments. Let's bring Paul in now. Paul, uh, he did an okay job, Alicia said. Just in terms of that, I think many people are sitting there saying, what does the Labour Party stand for? Who is Keir Starmer? I think Alicia's point is really valid actually. Many people haven't seen the real hit him. Is this more of the real him? Will we see more of this? The more relaxed man of the people? I think he is growing into the role, you know. I mean, he hasn't been leader all that long and uh, much of that time was taken up with COVID. So people don't really know him. Uh, and also people don't really think about politics that much, don't forget. You know, most people are not wondering what the leader of the Labour Party is up to today. Um, and now we get into a general election year, they will start to switch on. So he is uh, introducing himself still. Um, and the stuff around the St George's flag, I think, is a perfect example of this. You know, he is a proper football fan. He does care about these things. And uh, the fact that he gave the interview to The Sun at all is interesting, because some Labour figures in the past would have refused to talk to The Sun. So the fact he's reaching out to Sun readers, uh, who he knows full well might well be thinking about voting Labour at the next election for the first time, um, is a, a sort of a positive sign, I think, that he's reaching out. Uh, he doesn't have to try. I mean, he is a a bloke. He, he does like his football and his beer. You know, he is that sort of a chap. And uh, that's what the public is slowly and start, uh, sh surely starting to see. Um, he was happy to talk about the England flag and the England kit, uh, Paul, but there were other questions he was a bit less uh, willing to answer, whether he'd ever taken drugs, for example, but on policy uh, issues as well, uh, talking about the pensions triple lock, very much mm. refusing to commit on anything on that. Is that going to be a problem well, for him when we go to the polls? Well, the bigger problem will be that if Labour goes into the polls with a, a massive sort of spending commitment, which the Conservatives could then wrap up as being a huge tax rise, that's what Labour's fear is, that there'll be a sort of tax bombshell campaign from the Conservatives and put people off. So they're being ever so cautious about spending commitments and they're getting criticised for it. But the, the, the calculus is that it's better to be criticised for being cautious than it is to be criticised for taking everyone's uh, tax. So that, that's why you, you're starting to see these. And you mentioned the 28 um, billion on in green investment. You know, they are a lot of flack for that, but it's probably better to get that row out of the way now than have it hanging around your head in, a, in an election. And on the flag, of course, he's just in, you know, instinctively on the side of everyone who is waking up this morning, utterly outraged at what Nike have done to the England strip and to the flag. It's an absolute nonsense. And they need to, you know, by lunchtime, they need to tell us that they're not going to do this because it's an affront uh, and it's an insult and it's entirely unnecessary. 
Um, Alyssa, let's move now to the migrant crisis because Rishi Sunak has made it one of his five key pledges to judge him on for the general election. Stop the boats, remember. Yesterday, 500 people came into this country. We're now at 4,000. These numbers are off the scale. Meanwhile, we're now in this absurd position of the safety of Rwanda bill being in the ping-pong stage. I think most people watching this are wondering what on earth is our parliamentary democracy is based on. So essentially going from the Commons to the Lords, back to the Commons again, another seven amendments. Yes, and the, the trouble is, is the Conservatives keep coming forward and saying they have a plan, but the trouble is, is the plan, whatever it is, isn't working, clearly. I mean, this is a huge amount of illegal migrants to actually make it across the channel here to the UK, and it's just adds to an already really, really high number. So this is something that Rishi Sunak pretty much pinned his whole leadership on. It's stopping illegal migration. And it's something that is just totally not going well for him in, in any regard. And as you said, David, we've now got this ping pong stage between the two houses. Just to simplify that, that is where the House of Commons make a piece of legislation. It then goes to be assessed and scrutinised by the House of Lords. They try and make some changes. It goes back and then back and forth until they eventually compromise. And at the moment, it's going to be looking like quite some time until that happens. Mm. Uh, Paul, uh, the Conservative Party uh, say that it's all Labour's fault. It's Labour peers. They say they're trying to break the smuggling gangs. They're trying to prevent people crossing uh, the channel, but they're being obstructed uh, by Labour. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? But it's the failure of the policy. Uh, you know, the policy itself is utterly failing. And to pin your entire strategy on getting flights off to Rwanda, which will only affect a tiny, tiny number of, of the people arriving, is a nonsense. I mean, historians will look back at this with absolute... Uh, unbelievable. You know, they won't believe that the, the whole of the government strategy was based but, but on what getting is a flight Keir's, off from Heathrow so, sorry, to Rwanda. What, you know, what is Keir nonsense. Starmer's policy? What would he do? We spent 500 million on France. That hasn't exactly worked out. We signed the Frontex deal. That hasn't worked out. What would Starmer do? Well, Starmer and Yvette Cooper have talked about stopping the boats, but you stop them before they get to the French coast. You know, you disrupt the business model by smashing the gangs and you invest in policing and security forces doing that in conjunction with the Belgians and the French uh, in order to stop the gangs from getting anywhere near the beaches of, of Europe before they get anywhere near the UK. And to talk about, you know, stopping people once they're on the water is nonsense. And that's obviously failing because of the numbers that we're seeing arriving. And uh, the cost, I mean, I live in Eastbourne and they've just closed the hotels here uh, and they've dispersed the, uh, the the asylum seekers that were living in the hotels. It's going to cost far more to shut those hotels and then send them off to other parts of the UK than the po policy that we had. It's, it's burning up money. It's not working. And most of all, it's not helping the poor souls who are arriving here traumatised from war zones who just want to make a better life. Uh, Labour Special Advisor uh, Paul Richards and Alicia Fitzgerald, thank you very much indeed. Former Labour Special Advisor, I should say. Uh, Paul, thank you both very much indeed for coming on. Still to come on Talk Today, the Sickness Benefits Bill is set to rise by a third. And 10,000 Botswana elephants could soon be sent to London's Hyde Park. Wow. Former Conservative Advisor Charlie Rowley and Barrister Paula Roan. Adrian, take us through this morning's papers. That's next. Do stay with us. The time, 6.22. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh. Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.25. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment. But here's what else is coming up in today's programme. Millions of women face missing out on compensation over state pension changes. Discussing that in the papers next. Yeah, Prince William is reportedly frustrated over the theory circulating about the Princess of Wales' whereabouts. That's coming up at 6.50. And could a string of IT issues that led to payment services at a number of retailers uh, failing be the result of a cyber attack? We'll discuss that at 7.40. We certainly will. First of all, that all-important weather, Joe. What is it looking like? <laughs> Do you really want to know? No. No, I don't think you do, actually. Uh, but earlier this week, we saw temperatures up to 18.8, I think, in London. It was lovely. London. It was lovely. Yes, it was almost a glimpse of spring, wasn't it? That's come to an end. It's going to turn colder over the weekend. And we've got showers to go with that. Rain this morning. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Yes, things are going to stay very unsettled over the next few days. We've got low pressure in charge again, and that's really going to stay with us over the weekend, bringing us some wet and very windy weather at times. Things improve a little bit on Tuesday, oh, sorry, on Sunday, but only as we see this next system starting to make its way in. And again, that's a very untidy system which splits continues to rotate and just bring further unsettled conditions into next week. So really, as we go through today, we've got this area of cloud and rain in the south. That is going to take a long time to clear. It'll be much later in the afternoon before it finally gets away from southeastern areas. And that's going to leave us with a mixture of sunny spells and showers. Now, some of these showers could be on the heavy side, could be wintry over the high ground of Scotland as well, because that rain is introducing this colder air. So we are going to see temperatures close to normal over the weekend. But, of course, that close to normal is going to feel pretty chilly, given the fact we've seen higher values just recently. And, of course, the strength of the winds, which today will be strongest over parts of Scotland. Here, temperature just 7 or 8 degrees Celsius, but with that wind, it will feel considerably colder. So we go with the sunshine and showers through the course of the day. These are coming in from the northwest, so it will be central, southern, southeastern areas that see the best of the dry weather, the best of the clearer skies. And over the weekend, if you do manage to get out of the wind into a spot of sunshine, well, it will actually feel, it will feel quite nice. And then through the course of Saturday, we're going to see further showers coming through. Those are the overnight temperatures, so there is a chance of seeing a touch of frost in places. But for most of us, the winds will be too strong. And indeed, through Saturday, those winds will be stronger than today, particularly in the south. So even though temperatures in southern areas will reach around 10 or 11 degrees Celsius, it'll feel more like 5 or 6 degrees Celsius. So it is going to be a chilly feel. And again, we'll see some wintry showers over Scotland, even parts of the Pennines and over the high ground of Wales as well. So pretty much everywhere likely to see sunny spells and showers through the course of Sunday. Things are going to stay pretty unsettled into the coming week, but temperatures do start to recover.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Joe. Now, you should have been listening to Joe's weather forecast before see. you headed off on your holiday with all the wrong gear, shouldn't you? Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you very it's much. It was, to it was utterly amazing. I packed all the wrong clothes. And it was quite cold as you go to Antarctica, allegedly. I didn't know that. You do now. <laughs> I do now. Um, it's time to take a look through Friday's papers now with Barrister Paula Rowan Adrian and yeah. former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley. Good morning. Good uh, morning to both to the of two you. Of you. Can we start with the Daily Telegraph uh, punt front page? Uh, Charlie, this is a big headline sickness benefits bill to rise by a third. This is utterly staggering, isn't it? The OBR expects spending on health and disability benefits to rise from 65.7 billion to 90 billion, 90. 0.9 billion in 2028 and 2029. This is unaffordable. Uh, it is, and that's the question, is whether um, the UK has the money in the coffers to continue to fund the rising bill where people are uh, claiming for back pain uh, is the number one issue. Also mental health, which the Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride has caused uh, a, a debate this week, to put it lightly, that um, uh, mental health has sort of gone too far, where you know, people are issuing payments to young people, to children, to uh, families, where actually something is just uh, maybe part of the normal working day, where we might just be able to get by in olden times, is now being issued with a payment. Well, he says the normal stresses and strains. Normal well. stresses, exactly, exactly so. So the question is, if this continues to, uh, uh, to go on, uh, the bill will continue to rise. Can the UK afford it? I suggest probably it can't. And there was a backlash to those comments mm. from Mel Stride, wasn't there, uh, Paula? With you know doctors it. saying people aren't pretending to be sick; they actually are sick. And oh. if you've ever tried to claim benefits, when I was about 19, which was a long time ago, Charlie, <laughs> um, I, I, I was stuck in between finishing college and going to university, um, living on my own, etc. And I tried to claim benefits, and I gave up because it was just so hard. Like, the process is just so hard. And what we do know is that 19 billion goes unclaimed a year in terms of eligible benefits. Mm. Um, and so I'm intrigued at why it is the Conservative Party feel it's appropriate to attack those who are considered ill by their GPs, you know, medical but, uh, but, uh, side. I do, I do think there is a problem in that, and, and I blame the government, actually, in that they've, they've uh, cocooned people. They told people to stay at home. So people who were socially anxious anyway were told throughout COVID to stay at home and that you mustn't go out. And, of course, that makes your anxiety worse. I'm not saying they don't, they don't have an illness and they don't need help, but, actually, haven't we actually caused the problem in the first place? I mean, you can... I think the other thing is, and I do agree with that point to a certain extent, is that we've also seen, coming out of lockdown, that there is a different way that we can live our lives. Um, and that different way of living our lives is to be able to work from home, is to be able to look at new and innovative ways that we can still work, but at the same time acknowledge the fact that, you know, this isn't going to be able to work for me or I'm going to struggle doing X, Y and Z. So, you know, be sensitive to that. I'm not seeing that sensitivity there. But in there. which case, if we're able to work from home, we don't need to claim... The benefits then, do we? If we Well, we know that we do. We know that most benefits that are claimed are actually in work benefits. Mm. Um, and that's something that, that we're not seeing in the press enough. But it goes, I think, uh, wider to the idea of you know what we what we do rely on the state for. So the NHS, you know, I think there are still far too many people that present themselves at A yes. and E as a uh, first port of call rather than a last resort. We still see far too many people <laughs> signed off work by GPs when it should be a lot more focus on what people can do rather than what they can't do, and making sure that actually you've got to have a tougher conversation with the public to say you can't just... But actually, I think it's also unfair for the GPs because mm. the GPs are the ones that are the gatekeepers for everything. Mm. Yeah. The GPs are busy. There aren't enough GPs mm. that we know. Uh, and so if you constantly are saying to the GP you need to assess disability benefits, you need to work out if people fall below th certain thresholds, we've also got 9 million economically inactive people in this country. So something is wrong. It, it is. Um, uh, and, um, but the way to fix it isn't by continuing to sign people off or to continue is to issue benefits to people uh, when they could be in work, when there can be uh, a way in which you can encourage people to uh, live their best lives as their, uh, to the ultimate maximum, rather than sort of uh, relying on uh, benefits or claiming, you know, uh, uh, mental health problems uh, when actually they are just the normal stresses of, of life, as Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, was saying. But I think we're Should we take... I just, I'm sorry, 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 I'm going to move us yes. on to the next story, otherwise mm. we, we won't get through everything. But um, the 
whole talking about very big bills for the government, there's another one uh, coming yes. if they decide to pay it. And this is for the WASPy yes. uh, women yes. who say that the pension changes they weren't given adequate notice and therefore they couldn't make financial plans for their retirement. Yes, yeah, so this is the Women Against State Pension Inequality and it leads the front page in the Daily Express. Um, we had a report out yesterday. Um, the report said that the government need to apologise. The report said that the government need to compensate women who fall into this bracket of having lost out. And we're looking at compensation of roughly between £1,000 to £3,000. But we're talking about millions of women who potentially fall into this bracket. Now, what's interesting is that the campaigners um, say, actually, even the report is not doing them sufficient justice and that the compensation should be at least £10,000. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've still got quite a, a disparity between what uh, the report says and what the campaigners are saying. However, are the government going to pay even the slightest bit of attention to this report? And well, that's the question. And, and that's a brilliant point, isn't it, Charlie? Because the Ombudsman's report isn't binding. It has no legal powers whatsoever. I mean, th there's quite an interesting editorial in The Telegraph today saying, well, this was mooted in 1995. It came in in 2010 or thereabouts. So, actually, there was a lot of time. Is it really up to the government to communicate those ch pension changes to the women? Shouldn't they have... I'm going to, I'm careful what I'm going to say here in case I get hit but shouldn't they have <laughs> shouldn't they actually have made actually you know concerted efforts to understand the changes that were coming well, I think there is a, a responsibility on everybody to make sure that any changes take place that um, that is communicated in the best and most effective uh, way possible. Um, uh, I do think there has to be some understanding from the government that actually changing uh, the pension age as it was changed, uh, which affected so many of these uh, uh, women at short notice, uh, very short notice, um, is clearly a problem because it didn't allow people to plan for their futures, didn't allow women to plan for their uh, future lives. And so I think there is responsibility to bear on part of the government whether or not paying out £3,000 to every single person uh, or every one of those people is the right approach. Um, I suspect uh, it is simply unaffordable, but I do think there has to be that element of uh, responsibility. Well, you could also then say £3,000 isn't enough because it actually you're missing out on all those years, aren't you? Well, you're missing out on years, and we're talking about women who are now at a certain stage in their life. Um, how long are they going to be able to wait? We know what the government's approach has been in terms of compensation, for example, to the post office masters. Mm -hmm. We know the difficulties mm -hmm. um, that those who have been in the, the uh, suffered in relation to the uh, infected blood. Um, I'm just that's one of the problems, isn't yes. it? They've got those big bills coming up yes. as well as this. Um, we are going to be talking about this uh, shortly, actually, because we're going to be talking to Angela Madden, uh, who is the campaign chair uh, for Waspy. So we'll get lots more on that from her. We certainly will. Now, Charlie, your private members club, the Garrick. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is the front page. this is the front page of The Guardian. Top lawyers <laughs> urge judges to leave all male Garrick. Now, a group of more than 60 lawyers in England and Wales has called on all judges who are members of the Men Only Garrick Club to resign from the club, immediately claiming membership is incompatible with the core principles of justice, equality and fairness. What is wrong with having an all male club? I see nothing wrong with it at all. Well, first of all, I'm delighted that you think that I could ever be a member of <laughs> such a club. I have no membership to any, to any part Were of the club. Were you to be club. a member, would you what? be reviewing your membership right <laughs> now, Charlie? Um, I, I, I don't think I, I necessarily would, but um, I think it's up to the club. Uh, ultimately to... Because the, 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 the club admits um, uh, actors, it admits artists, it admits lawyers. Um, mm -hmm. I would rather be part of a club that admits um, men and women as well. But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, I've been to the Garrett Club. I have been, I must confess. I have been on a... Twice, actually. Um, and um, uh, it was it was very nice. But, <laughs> but <laughs> that aside... Um, it because has, there was no women there. It has gone... There were women there. Oh, that's no, that's, that's what confused me. You yes. can, yes. That's, but yes. that's what confused me, because... I think it was an un... You know, I thought it was quite an open... Um, uh, well known to the public that it was a, a, only a, a male-only uh, mm. membership. But uh, there were women there when I was there and it was a perfectly enjoyable experience. <laughs> but but I think you went, when, <laughs> since that list has been exposed, we've seen obviously... I'm signing. told if you go as a woman, though, you've got to walk down several flights of steps to the basements if you want to go to the loo. You're certainly not... You know... You're told, I bet you've been. I've never been. <laughs> Have you? No. Oh. No. Um, 
Paula? Yeah, I think what's quite... I've never been. I think what's quite interesting about this story is the fact that um, some of my Brooklyn lawyers are saying, you know, if you're, if you're a judge and you appear on this list, you need to consider uh, handing back your membership. Um, you know, there, are, there is a, a code of conduct, of course, that, that, that barristers and, and uh, judges have to comply with. Um, however, in my own profession, I am aware of certain members of the bar... Uh, being uh, members of parties, political parties, that as a woman of colour, if I say no more than that, that I would be, you know, very uncomfortable about knowing that they were members of. And yet they are members of these parties. Mm. So, you know, it's an individual thing. And if I was to appear in front of a judge who I knew was a member of the Garrett Club, yes, I might, you know, have a closer eye on how he manages me and how he manages my case, but I'm not going to suggest he should step down, no. Well um, said. Have we got time for any more? <laughs> I We've don't run think out so. of time. I think we're out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> we've got lots more. We are going to see you again in the next yeah, hour, might. though, yes. aren't we? So uh, we've got lots more. We can talk about those elephants that may well be finding a new home in Hyde Park, if, uh, <laughs> according to Botswana's uh, threats. We'll talk about that in the next hour. Paula and Charlie, thank you both very much indeed. Now, moving on, as we discussed in the papers there, a watchdog has recommended that the government apologises and gives payout to the women affected by the increase in the state pension age. The Ombudsman called for the affected WASPy women to be given between £1,000 and £2,950 in compensation for the injustices that they suffered. So, what have the WASPy women been campaigning for? Well, before 2010, the state pension age for women was 60 and for men it was 65. Now, since then, it has risen to 65 for women to bring them into line with men. Today, it stands at 66 for both men and women. Wasby say that as many as 3.8 million women weren't made aware of the age change and were forced to delay retirement without adequate warning. Well, joining us now is Angela Madden, who's the chair of Wasby, the group that has been campaigning for women against state pension inequality since uh, 2015. Angela, really good to talk to you uh, this morning. Obviously, this is something close to your heart. You've been campaigning tirelessly for this. What do the findings of this landmark report actually mean to you today, this morning? Well, good morning. Um, we're very pleased that the report is finally um, published. The, the Ombudsman has been working on it for five years. And three years ago, he actually found that um, we were right in saying that the Department of Work and Pensions didn't tell the women in time that um, our state pension age was changing. Um, we must remember, it was a very different world in the 70s when we started working. Um, there was no paid for childcare. There was um, uh, no uh, stakeholder pension schemes. It was okay and legal for women to be barred from joining occupational pension schemes, even if the company they work for had them. So women our age do rely on the state pension much more than men. You've heard of the pensions gap. You know, that's not going to be closed for uh, until 2040 at least. Um, but the issue for us is the state pension age had been 60 for women since 1947. So when we went to work, we were told the state pension age was 60. I actually worked for the post office until 2004, a, a company that was wholly owned by the government. And I was fortunate enough to be in their occupational pension scheme. And every year I had a benefit statement from that scheme saying these benefits are in addition to your state pension, which is payable at 60. Um, so there was evidence out there for us that the state pension age was 60. Even the um, Department of Work and Pensions own website on the landing page where you go to um, before you make an inquiry or do anything else, it clearly stated until February 2016 that the state pension age for women was 60 and for men was 65. Um, now, the first letter I received from the Department for Work and Pensions was in 2005, and it was an unsolicited automated pensions forecast. And bear in mind, this was the first letter that the Department of Work and Pensions had written to people since the change to the state pension age for women. 
And in that letter, it told me exactly how much state pension I would receive. It asked questions like, have you made savings? This will not be enough for you to live on. I found it very helpful. Yeah. Now, at no point in that letter was the state pension age mentioned. And Angela, uh, uh, you've now got the report from the Ombudsman, yeah. and, and it has found yeah. that the government failed to adequately inform women about the increases in the, the, the pension age. But is yes. it going to make any difference? Because the noises from the government aren't exactly convincing on this, are they? No, well, they, they, they haven't said a thing since it came out um, yesterday morning. Um, but the noises from MPs generally are supportive. I mean, we did have over 160 MPs write to the Ombudsman on our behalf while this investigation was going on. There's also an all-party parliamentary group that provided evidence to the um, Ombudsman, and they think that the injustice we've suffered are at level six on the Ombudsman's severity of injustice scale, which starts at much higher than 3,000. That starts at 10,000 pounds a person. I mean, it is a lot of money, but you must remember we are the victims of this injustice. We didn't create it. The government created it okay. by choosing to keep us in the dark. Can, can I just... There's an editorial in The Telegraph saying that actually women should have been aware of the pension changes that were happening at that time. You said right at the beginning it's a very different world. It was a very different world. You didn't have social media. You didn't have the kind of information that we now do. Do you think women should have known that the pension changes were coming? We certainly should have. And there should have been efforts to let us know. And the Department of Work and Pensions themselves did surveys to see if we knew, and they knew as early as 2004 that we didn't. There were, I mean, would you expect to see a state pension age change, a huge change in, 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 in state pension provision in an advert, in a newspaper? Um, I, I, I don't think so. And I mean, it, the Times itself carried an, a, 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 a story and it said, state pension age set to change in 2020. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't change in, in 2020. It started changing for people in 2010, and yep. they completely removed the age from state pension and gave women completely different state pension ages. Now, they said that was a gradual increase, but for the women involved, there was nothing gradual about it. No, quite. I mean, they did write and inform me, I expected to retire at 60 in 2014 on my 60th birthday and they wrote out in 2012 and told me my state pension age was March 2020, mm -hmm. some six years later. And that was the first communication we had from the government telling us what our state pension age is. And a very significant difference indeed. Angela Madden, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. That's Angela Madden, Waspy campaign chair. Uh, still to come, the Princess of Wales has been subject to endless conspiracy theories in recent weeks and William is not happy about it. We'll be getting all the latest royal news from Afia Hagen. That is next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know.
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back. It's been the question on everyone's lips. Where is Kate? And now there is data to reveal the true scale of the conspiracies. That's right. Over the past seven days, the hashtags where is Kate and Kate Body Double and Kate Middleton have been used on social media accounts and web pages with a total reach of 400 million people. Royal commentator Afir Hagen joins us now. Afir, it has been completely mad, hasn't it? <laughs> it absolutely has. It's I mean, been... I can't think of any other way of describing it. No, it's just been absolutely bonkers. And those three hashtags actually just prove how much people are looking at this. I mean, my 12-year-old is coming every day and showing me things on TikTok, you know, videos, memes, conspiracy theories, all of that. And it, it is absolutely global. I mean, this week, I've been talking to channels in Canada, Australia, India, Nigeria, everybody is really caught up in this kind of sense of conspiracy theory, all these theories that have made their way from the dark corners of the internet to pretty much mm. to the mainstream now, absolutely. Mm. It is a global story, um, one that I think is a bit out of control at the moment. I think it's totally out of control. I came back from holiday and I've heard everything. I've heard that Kate is dead, the king is dead, uh, so many conspiracy theories yeah. about what happened to her. Actually, when you look at what the facts of this, she mm -hmm. said she was having an elective procedure. She said she would be back after Easter. The facts mm -hmm. haven't changed. The facts haven't changed, but I think the problem is, and I keep saying this, is that the PR and communications team at Kensington Palace didn't anticipate that this vacuum of information would be filled by social media, by conspiracy theory. And actually, looking back at that, if they were doing better crisis management, they would have known, actually, that that vacuum of information just isn't going to work. People are so used, and when I say people, I mean royal watchers and the British media and everybody in between is so used to seeing the Princess of Wales that not seeing her is unusual and therefore it spawns up all Well, then theories. when we did see her, is it her well, or is exactly. it not her? And I mean, all thing. of that stuff. Um, meanwhile, they're trying, they want us to focus on the, the charity work. Yeah. And what they do. they're actually doing. There's a big report out yesterday mm -hmm. about the Princess of Wales's early years uh, project. Yeah. And the fact that she's keeping an eye on things from yeah. home. Working from home, working from bed, all of us do it. Uh, but also the fact that this particular tool, it's the Alarm Distress uh, alarm distress Baby Scale, which is a tool that was developed by earlier's Year's project, has been quite successful. This is about recognising a baby's cues and better communication between health visitors and parents and everybody in between. And actually, it's been so successful that they want to roll that out further. So that's a good news mm. story, right? That's good news that something she's doing 
doing with the Shaping Us project has been effective, uh, has been successful and is going to be rolled out across the board. Now, uh, at the same time, the Queen has been uh, hard at work, hasn't she? She's been in Belfast. Mm -hmm. She's been upstaged. She has, <laughs> by the cutest little boy in his <laughs> little tuxedo, bless oh. him, um, <laughs> by this little Fitzwilliam Corey Salmon. Um, he was doing some great posing. I wonder if you've been practicing beforehand in the mirror. <laughs> and there he is. Uh, I think his mum's an ex-Blue Peter presenter. She is. is Zoe Salmon, yes. I think yes. it is. So, he, you know, it's in the genes <laughs> to work <laughs> the camera. He's absolutely adorable. It's just his little tux. I just can't go over it at all. Uh, and completely photobombed the Queen, yeah? With the Queen there, and she took it well. She took it with jest. And meanwhile, she was asked by everybody that she of saw course. about the King's health. She gave a little bit of an update. Yeah, it says that he's doing well. Uh, there were some comments about men being difficult called Patience, which we you all that. are. We really um, are. And she says that she's keeping him in check. So what do we know about the King? Obviously, I'm catching up, having come back from holiday. He mm -hmm. had that operation, didn't he, did. he for yep. a benign condition. Mm -hmm. He was then diagnosed with something else. Do we know any more? No. We don't. So we don't know what type of cancer, we don't know the diagnosis, we don't know the prognosis, we don't know the stage. But we have seen him. We've seen him meeting world leaders, meeting ambassadors, Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt, ahead of the, the, the budget. You know, we've seen him going to church, going to London Tomb from treatment. Um, so it, he's, he is up and about a little bit clearly still fulfilling his constitutional function, but we don't have any more information about the type of cancer he has. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, with the slimmed down monarchy, it shows actually how thinly spread they are. Yes. When, when... when you see Camilla exactly. out and about all the time, and that is the real focus. But yeah. we've reached this point where, you know, these conspiracy theories are now starting to be... We've had Sir Keir Starmer yep. talking about them. We've yep. had the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yep. Justin Welby talking about, you know, village tittle-tattle and gossip and saying that, you know, someone who has had surgery should be able to recover in privacy, which, I, you know, I think we can all agree with that. I think we can all think that that's absolutely true. And I think that just shows the extent to which this is being talked about. If you've got people in politics and in, in public life saying yeah, that telling people to butt down. out, leave yeah. it alone. And also, I think the idea that staff at the London Clinic trying to access the notes of the princess, I mean, that's totally unacceptable from... Um, my medical perspective. It's something that we would never do. And, mm. and that just shows how high these stakes are. Absolutely. And I think with that, you know, you've got three people who are under investigation at the moment. The London Clinic clearly humiliated and furious. But I think I would also say that I would not be surprised if the person that was trying to do that was trying to do it to earn some money, right? Why else would you... I mean, you're going to be nosy, yes, but... Caught up, is potentially. Bigger. You know, yeah. we don't know the circumstances, but caught up in this huge clamouring for, for information. Um, Afir, always fabulous to see you. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed for coming on. Still to come, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will return to Israel today, pushing America's demand for a ceasefire in the conflict. More on that next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry-on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. Good morning. It is 7 o'clock on Friday, the 22nd of March. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. The US on a peace mission. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel today as he pushes for a sustained and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. A playful update or a woke agenda. Sir Keir Starmer blasts England's new football kit over a multicoloured redesign of the St George's Cross. And the Dragons in Europe. Wales' football team beat Finland, moving them one game away from Euro 2024 qualification. Talk Sports' Sam Ellard has the latest this hour. And the weather hasn't been perfect this last week, but it has been very mild. The weekend weather is not going to be perfect either, but it is going to be an awful lot colder. All the details coming up shortly. Sounds wonderful, Joe. Thank you very Just much. Just in time for yeah. the weekend. Sounds wonderful. Now, yesterday, 500 migrants made their way across the channel, so the total number now, 4,000. Rishi Sunak has made it one of his pledges for the general election to stop the boats. How has this dented the impact of what he's saying? What does this do to his electoral prospects? Let us know. You can email us talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv. You can also text the word talk and your message to 87. Also, let us know what you think about England's uh, new football kit and the redesign of the St George's flag. Looking forward to hearing from you on that. Uh, now, though, all your headlines with Miranda. Good morning. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken visits Israel today and says there must be a sustained ceasefire now in Gaza. The United Nations Security Council is also expected to vote today on a United States drafted resolution. A ceasefire would be conditional on the release of some of the remaining captives taken by Hamas in its attack on Israel on October the 7th. The need for an immediate sustained ceasefire with the release of hostages. Uh, that would create space to surge more humanitarian assistance to relieve uh, the suffering of many people and to build something more enduring. Well, it comes, as witnesses said, Israeli forces had escalated their operation around Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, carrying out a number of airstrikes. Footage released by Hamas military wing also shows fighters targeting Israeli tanks around the area. Researchers looking to create the world's first lung cancer jab have been given up to £1.7 million in funding. Scientists are using similar technology that created the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. The cash from cancer charities is to develop LungVax, which aims to kill cancer cells. 
The Home Secretary has vowed to crack down on spiking, as he said perpetrators will be held to account by changes in the law. James Cleverly said the government is updating legislation as he visited offices during the first National Week of Action against spiking. What we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls and the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. Sakir Starmer has told The Sun he thinks Nike should recall England's official kit for Euro 2024. Appearing on the first episode of a brand new weekly politics show called Never Mind the Ballots, the Labour leader slammed the FA and Nike for changing what he said was the unifying St George's flag. And finally, commuter traffic chaos of a different kind in Gloucestershire as a herd of Highland cattle has brought the town centre of Minch in Hampton to a standstill. Take a look at this. Drivers and pedestrians looked on as their cows made their way along the high street on their way to their new fields of green. What a life. <laughs> That's it I for now. love that. Yeah, Thank I love you. That I wouldn't well, mind being stuck in that traffic jam. <laughs> no, it, it makes a change, doesn't it, as you're making your way to school or, or to your work or whatever. Yeah, it's probably uh, equally polluting, though, isn't it? <laughs> I think we'll draw a line at that, that moment. Uh, talking about the channel migrant crisis, many of you getting in uh, contact about that. Elaine says, look, there is no plan. Rishi Sunak is delivering absolutely nothing for the citizens of the UK. He is a waste of space. Tyler, though, says Labour will do nothing to reduce these numbers. If anything, they're more likely to push for more migration to the UK. I keep saying this is going to be top of the agenda come the general election. Uh, on the New England football shirt, uh, changing the colours of the St George's Cross, we've been asking, do you think Nike should change it back to the traditional colours? Herbert says, who at the FA signed off on this? It will cost them millions in sales. Can you imagine the same Nike doing this to the US soccer team? Uh, and Richard says, the symbol on the back of the shirt does not represent St George or the national flag of England. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, we can probably get it on screen, but here you go, on the front of the Telegraph, you can see the new multicoloured, apparently, that is the St George's Cross. So, so I think you make a great point. Would they dare to do this with any other flag? No, I don't think so. It's the national flag of England, the flag of St George, and it should be flown with pride. Keir Starmer is absolutely uh, right here. Let us know your thoughts, uh, please, on this abomination, I think, to the St George's Cross. Let's move on now to our top story this morning. And the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, will return to Israel today in hope of reaching a sustained and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Blinken began a tour of the Middle East, holding talks with Arab leaders in Saudi Arabia uh, yesterday. Joining us now with all the latest on this is international lead for Salem, Sarit Michaeli. Uh, good morning to you, uh, Sarit. Uh, Antony Blinken saying yesterday the two sides are, are getting closer together. How hopeful are you of prospect of some kind of agreement? Well, I think the question is whether there will be enough international pressure on the Israeli government to accept what is needed for um, a ceasefire and a, a prisoner swap and a, and a hostage swap. Uh, it's not um, a process that the Israeli government has shown it's interested to go uh, through. Uh, there is intense pressure from the Israeli right to continue the war. Uh, the prime minister is broadly thought to be considering primarily his own political uh, fortunes rather than the possibility of averting uh, at the continuation of this uh, war and returning our hostages. And therefore, I think the, the relevant question is whether Secretary Blinken and other international leaders will clarify to the Israeli government it must pursue this path. When you, when you look back, Netanyahu was very, very clear there would be a Palestinian council, there would be no place for any Palestinian authority in, in the way that this is resolved. Hamas responded to his plan, they turned it down flatly. There is a real change here in the tone from the United States, isn't there? The United States, I think, is desperate to find some sort of solution. It's come up with this deal. The Palestinian Authority would be back in Gaza. All parties also committing to to a two-state solution. That has to be the answer, doesn't it? I think there is a growing understanding within the international community that left to his own devices, Prime Minister Netanyahu is just going to continue this war because this is what is working for him electorally, because he's trying to push away any possibility of the consideration of them the day after 
both in terms of the horrific humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, also in terms of the terrible, horrific situation of our hostages that are in Gaza for over 165 days now. Um, and then additionally, in terms of his own political survival. This is the point. And if Secretary Blinken is actually going to use US foreign policy uh, to clarify, to stress to the Israeli government there is no other option, then we might see a change. But for as long as the international community and primarily the US is only willing to use statements rather than action, we'll see a continuation of what we're seeing right now, which is just ongoing promises of a total victory that is absurd and also leading to more and more uh, humanitarian horrors like we're seeing in Gaza right now with people on the brink of famine, children starving, and Israeli hostages still, uh, you know, in, in just absolutely horrific conditions. And that the point being made by uh, the British Foreign Secretary David Cameron this week, the very, very strongly uh, worded uh, letter accusing Israel of being behind the delays of aid getting through, obstructing the trucks, some British supplies held up at the border uh, for three weeks, and it says Israel could turn the taps on now if it wanted to. Uh, you talked about action rather than words. What are the levers that uh, Britain, America uh, and allies could pull now? Well, I think it's absolutely crucial to expose the gaslighting of the Israeli government in its denial of Israel's responsibility for the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza and its policy of revenge for the atrocities that Hamas perpetrated against Israeli civilians in October 7th. Um, I think it's crucial that every uh, lever, that every, every option is, uh, is utilized in order to just make it clear to both Israelis and to our government that it's simply not acceptable to now continue to threaten with a military operation in Gaza that could lead to mass killings of civilians without any other possibility and also to the continuation of the process whereby the Israeli hostages are slowly uh, but surely dying off horrifically in Gaza in captivity and that this is just not acceptable. There are many options in terms of the international community using uh, leverage. Uh, uh, the UK, the US, the European Union, there is a growing, I think, discussion within Israel of the fact that this government's policies are leading to our international isolation. But this needs to be brought very, very clearly to the, um, to the to a decision point. We just cannot continue this foot dragging. And of course, there is another prong to this potential deal. That is the normalization of relationships between Saudi and Israel, which was at the beginning of this what sparked all of this in the first place. Of course, it means then there would be access to advanced US weapons and an American backed civilian nuclear power program. Just in terms of the ordinary Israeli, what's the view of Netanyahu? We heard from Yotam Confino earlier on in the program. He was saying that actually the majority of people in Israel really aren't in favour of what Netanyahu is doing? Well, I'm, it's, it's hard for me to speak on behalf uh, of the majority of Israeli public opinion because obviously I represent an NGO that is very clearly in, uh, in, in extreme opposition to what our government is doing. But I do think it's, it's, it's true and it's reflected in public opinion that the majority of Israelis understand the responsibility of Prime Minister Netanyahu in terms of his policies, in terms of his conduct, for the horrific catastrophe that befell us Israelis in October 7th, demand, want uh, a fresh elections, want to move away from, uh, from this government, from this sort of politics. This, I think, has been well established. There is also a, a large uh, part of Israel that does support a hostage swap, but the people in charge, the people who are controlling our government now are opposed to it because they want to continue the war in perpetuity in order to reoccupy Gaza and resettle it. I mean, those those kinds of sentiments exist within a, 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 very seriously within the people who make decisions about our future. And therefore, the only way really to like cause uh, this shift to change uh, course is if the international community, primarily the US, obviously, but the UK has a role, is very adamant with the Israeli government that this cannot continue as it is. 
Thank you very much indeed, Sarit McKayley, international lead for B'Tselem. Uh, let's now take another look at some of this morning's front pages. The Times reports that one million more people have blamed mental health battles as a reason for being uh, long-term sick, making it the leading cause of disability in working-age adults. Pay them what they're owed, demands the Mirror, as the paper says women left out of pocket by pension age rises must get payouts. And Kit hits the fans, blasts the sun, as the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, slams the New England football strip, not only for the alterations to the St George's Cross, but for the high price tag too. And sticking with that topic now, as there's been widespread outrage at what Nike is calling a playful update to the cross of St George on the New England football kit. Speaking on the, new, the Sun's new politics show, Never Mind the Ballots, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer thinks the kit maker got it wrong. Um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unifier. It doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. All right. I'm um, not even sure they can properly explain, explain why they thought they needed to change in the first place. Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald is back with us. We're also joined by former Labour official Richard Power Said. Richard, I'm going to come to you first. A playful update says Nike. No way, says Sir Keir Starmer. <laughs> What did they think they were doing? Yeah. It's so weird. I, when I saw it on Twitter yesterday, I was like... Ah. Did you think it was an April Fool's oh, joke? I mean, I just... It, my, my brain went... Bleh. I just couldn't understand what possibly they thought they were doing. And, and it just didn't, didn't look real. It looked so ugly. But, but what do you think strange. they were doing? Because you wouldn't do that to any other national flag. I mean, this is the cross of St George. It is the patron saint of England. This is our national flag. It's an abomination. OK, so you know what? I saw somebody saying exactly that. They wouldn't do it to any other flag. And so I did a little bit of Googling, and actually they've done it to loads of other flags. Um, and everyone always kicks off about it. So you sort of think, have they done have it they just learned? for some attention in North Well, I suppose argument? we're all talking, we're all looking <laughs> well, at the exactly. kids, aren't we? Well, would you buy it? It's £120. <laughs> yeah, I'd get a issue. knockoff. I mean, um, I can't uh, see you in football kit somehow, but it happens occasionally. <laughs> um, you know what? Um, the the thing is, right? It's just another example of global corporations not really caring, not being really interested in like what's going on nationally and locally. Mm. It's so stupid. It's 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 really culturally insensitive. The one thing I would say though is that the, the logic is that they have taken the is it it's the colors of the wristband from the 1966 rubbish I think that's rubbish a stretch, that's what, don't you? That's no, what no, they're no, saying well, no no but as in, as in like i think that is literally true i just think it's it nonsense because obviously you don't change the colors of a national but flag. the wristband Put them around the wrists again. Well, exactly, and make the flag. exactly. Yeah, yeah, I Can completely agree. Can we also agree. just say it's not even just changing the colours of the flag; it's <laughs> removed any semblance of a flag whatsoever. It's yeah. just a cross. Well I wouldn't even think it was a flag. It doesn't look anything like a flag. No, no. Like it's not. No, no. <laughs> Alyssa, it's ugly. It's no. also really ugly. Well, right? well, well, and actually, I think Starmer was looking very comfortable in this mm. interview. Actually, and he, he was more at home, more more used to himself. I think he was more comfortable in himself. Is this what we're going to see more from the Labour leader? I mean, I think he was quite keen not to talk about politics. This is an easy win for him. Definitely. I mean, that was definitely what he was trying to do, just to assert himself as a real human, because that's something he gets so much criticism for. And actually, not just him, to be fair. All prime ministers get so much criticism from the public about not potential seeming prime like... Ministers. Well, potential prime ministers, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, Freudian <laughs> slip. Um, but, you know, all... all, 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 all our senior politicians then, for, that yeah. just in general, all get criticism for just seeming a bit wooden, a bit out of touch. And I think he, if he, he is going to be the prime minister, he needs to kind of loosen up a bit and make the public feel like he is a real and relatable person. That's definitely what he was trying to do. He was very comfortable talking about the football shirts. He was a little less comfortable uh, when he was asked uh, about drugs. Shall we have a listen? When did you last take illegal drugs? Harry, I had a good time when I was a student. What does a good time when you're a student look like? Though? It means I had a good time when I was a student. But what does that mean? It means I had a good time when so I was a student. Some spliffs, doing some acid, partying, drugs. What, what was it? A good time. Come on, Richard. He had a good time. Did you get that? Yeah, I had a good time. I had a good, I had a good time. time. Don't, don't Did you, you have think a good that's, time? Don't, don't you think that's what we want from politicians? Is honesty. To have a good time. No, well, no, to have some, <laughs> to have some honesty. <laughs> Try and concentrate. Try to, uh, to have some honesty. To say, look, I took this and that, and actually that then plays into a much bigger conversation about drugs in this country. I mean. Kids, don't do drugs because then you'll become a really successful barrister <laughs> and then eventually a very successful uh, politician. I mean, 
Yeah. Oh, can we just stop asking politicians about their private well, lives? Well, he got asked all the questions that previous politicians had got stuck on, didn't yeah. he? What was the naughtiest thing he'd ever done? Of course, running through a field of wheat with <laughs> Theresa May. He didn't how have an answer pint, for that one. How much is a pint of milk? Uh, how much is a pint of milk? <laughs> how many children have you got? Because that one stumped Boris Johnson. <laughs> pint of milk is a really interesting one. When I was uh, back in the old days, when I was a journalist, um, I was on I was on a, um, a, a jet with a private jet with the deputy prime minister Nick Clegg. Hang on, um, just pick it up off the floor. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I saw that he had next to him an A4 sheet of paper printed out with like price of pint of milk is price of pint of beer is pint, uh, price of bread. Is. Well, it's a good point. The amount of prep that will have gone into doing an mm. interview like that, Alicia, in order to make him seem, you know, that yeah. can we give a true picture of the man that is secure? When it came out yesterday, I was thinking, I was like, I wonder how many years he's been waiting for that question, how often he's been briefed, <laughs> just to say, and they've said, Keir, just say you had a good time, just keep saying you had a good time, and he was like, that's his moment, because however many times Harry kept asking him, he just didn't stray away from that answer. No, so can we just talk about some politics, though, because I do think it's important as we come into the general election. <laughs> oh, go Don't on, be then. silly. We, 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 we <laughs> We had 500 people coming to this country illegally yesterday. We're now at 4,000. Rishi Sunak says, I'm going to stop the boats. The boats haven't stopped. What is Keir Starmer going to do? Because this is the bit I don't get. Keir Starmer, I still don't know what his policies are. He says he would intervene much earlier. They wouldn't come across the channel in the first place. How would he do that? Um, I mean, I think long term, uh, the, we've got to be thinking about things like how are we encouraging lots of the civil conflicts and and uh, and conflicts that are happening around the world by selling weapons to the countries that right, are causing short term, these conflicts. What are you going to do? What is what is he going to do short term? I don't think there is an answer to it short term. I mean, like that, 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 you might be surprised to hear that's not the official Labour line. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, like. Why are we having the record number of people coming across the channel this week? It's because the weather's better. Yeah. Why do we have loads of people coming across the channel at all? It's because we've got rid of the safe routes, so now people are doing the illegal there are still safe routes. routes. Wait, what are the safe well, routes? Well, according to the government, I looked this morning, they said there are safe and legal routes into this There country. are safe and legal routes if you're like... Ukrainian. An old, if you're a Ukrainian or if you're uh, um, uh, uh, an Afghan, Afghan interpreter who applied but then decided to come across the land. I mean, like, you know, it's kind of bull... Oh, dear, I didn't Rubbish. say that. It's nonsense. It's Utter David nonsense. Bull. <laughs> it's David Bull. <laughs> me into David Bull. Don't bring me into this. Just very quickly, Alicia, if Sorry, I can ask, Tom. we're now in ping pong. It just yeah. seems to me, if Rishi Sunak really wants this to happen, why doesn't this ping pong happen? And why doesn't he make them sit there all night until they actually thrash this out? Well, there's a few reasons why that could be. So, the, obviously... It was meant to be emergency legislation, that this Rwanda bill. It doesn't really scream emergency at the moment, does it, no. when it's going and to be delayed further. But some people are saying it might just be because it gives Rishi Sunak more time to actually work out how he's going to make this happen. Because there are still so many loose ends to tie up about this policy. It's not just a case of it becoming legislation. There are so many logistical factors that he has to get sorted out if he wants anyone to actually get on these planes and, and, and get on a flight to Rwanda. So... It might just be a case of buying a bit more time to try and actually make that work. For We're going him. to be stretching the definitions of spring somewhat, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> Would he potentially like to go into the next election saying, back the Rwanda deal or oppose the Rwanda deal? Potentially, that's another theory that people are saying, because we know full well that if Labour do get into government, they are not going to continue with the Rwanda policy at all. That will be scrapped by them if, if, if Keir Starmer is the Prime Minister. So... If maybe we can stretch that all the way up to the election, Rishi Sunak can say, well, you know, give me one more chance. You have me or you have no plan. Alicia, Richard, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Still to come on Talk Today, critics of a new hate crime in Scotland say it risks freedom of speech and men who brag about football are not scoring on dating apps. <laughs> Is that right? Barrister Paula Roan Adrian and former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley are back to take us through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today. The time is 7.21. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman. 
It's not a woman. A trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position. But I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Today it is 7.25 almost. Uh, we will have the papers in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Yeah, an interest rate cut could be on the horizon, according to Bank of England boss Andrew Bailey. We're discussing that in the papers next. Could a string of IT issues that led to payment services at a number of retailers be the result of cyber attack? That is coming up at 7.40. And more than 500 migrants crossed the channel in a single day yesterday. That brings the total to four. And of course, Rishi Sunak has made that one of his key pledges to make sure that he stops uh, the boats. You have been getting in touch with us uh, about that. Thomas says they've offered £3,000 to go to Rwanda and people wonder why the record numbers are coming over. Yeah, and it's a really good point, actually. And then also, in terms of the data, it's going to cost £167,000 per person that is sent to Rwanda. Is that a good use of money? Let us know. Uh, Matt says if they really wanted to stop the boats... They could. I think they do. They've made it a key pledge ahead of the election and uh, certainly Rishi Sunak being hammered on it uh, so far. But do keep getting in touch with us. Talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talk.tv. You can text us, text the word talk, plus your message to 8722. Uh, first, though, Joe is here with all of the weather. Is it spring? It is spring. Yes. It just doesn't look like it. Oh. Technical spring. Right. Technical spring, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, we're now past the... Uh, is it called the equinox? Yes. It's not the equinox, it's something no. else. It's no. where you literally get equal amounts of night and day. So, it's, yeah, again, it's technically spring, but it won't feel like it this weekend. It's going to turn colder. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. Well, this last week we've seen temperatures topping 18 degrees Celsius at times. That's a very pleasant 64 degrees Fahrenheit. But you can see it is going to be unsettled through the weekend. This area of low pressure staying with us really not very far away. We get a little respite on Sunday and then we start to see the next lot of low pressure systems coming in. It's going to give us some further unsettled weather next week, although temperatures will recover a little. But it's not just the temperatures uh, this weekend, it's also the wind. So we'll see a degree of wind chill. So first off, we've got this area of cloud and rain down towards the south. That is going to take a long time to clear. It'll be late in the day before it finally gets away from the far southeast. And what we'll see instead, sunshine and showers. Yes, those showers turning wintry over the high ground of Scotland. Quite uh, some downpours elsewhere. Now, they will be mostly focused in the northwest, where we'll see the strongest winds, gales there, through the course of today. But it becomes windy everywhere else as well. Those winds stronger still through Saturday. So temperatures perhaps reaching 11 or 12 degrees Celsius today. That's not too bad, around 8 or 9 for Scotland. And again, feeling colder in the wind. And then as we go through this evening and overnight, just more showers coming down from the northwest, pushing their way into central and eastern areas. But the difference with Saturday is that those winds will become stronger everywhere, particularly in the south. So even though we see temperatures potentially into double figures, uh, it'll feel a lot colder than that, probably only around 5 or 6 degrees Celsius. Not too much frost to start the day because it's uh, breezy possibly some sheltered central and eastern parts through the course of Saturday sunshine and showers feeling cold everywhere and again some of those showers turning wintry over the high ground of Scotland but further south as well into parts of the North Pennines also the high ground of Wales and temperatures for most staying in single figures and as I say that is going to feel very very chilly indeed uh, down through the south and then by the time we get to Sunday well we'll see uh, further showers but some of those starting to die away and uh, we'll see some drier conditions for parts of central and eastern areas. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Time to take another look through Friday's papers with barrister Paula Roan Adrian and former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley. Where should we start, Paula? Should we start with you um, and the Times? This is a new hate crime law in Scotland, there's warnings it could have a chilling effect on freedom of speech. Well, that's the concern, isn't it? And it's in page 11 of The Times today where we are told about the implementation of this new hate crime law. It comes into effect on the 1st of April and I don't know if we want to link it to April Fool's Day or not, but let's just get it out there. Um, but what it, what it tells us is, is that if you stir up hatred, you could, of course, be arrested and you could face criminal sanctions. Um, and where does the controversy come from in relation to that? Because is that so controversial if you were to stir up hatred in terms of my race? Well, that law has been in place in Scotland since 1986. So what is it that we're actually concerned about at the moment? Well, we're told that the law will cover things such as uh, disability, religion, those protected characteristics that we familiar uh, are familiar here in, in, in England and Wales in terms of being covered. Um, but what the Scottish law does is it now references transgender as a protective characteristic. And we have, uh, we're all aware, aren't we, of JK Rowling and the issues that she's uh, been having in terms of what she says is her freedom of speech in terms of what she considers to be the appropriate terminology for somebody's gender. Uh, we've got Elon Musk on X telling us that this is uh, going to be controversial and this is why we need to protect uh, our, our right to freedom of speech. And we've got our own government here saying it does have this chilling effect. Where do you stand on this? Sorry, I was just going to mm. say, because there is a difference between sex and gender, J.K. Yeah. Rowling is right, I think, to be able to express her own opinions. Well, do you? Do that... you not believe that? Do I believe that she has a right to express, yeah, to express her opinion? Her own opinion. I think absolutely she has a mm. right to express her opinion. I think it's very important for everybody to be able to express their opinion. I think it's important for everybody to be challenged about their opinion because that's how we learn, that's how we mm. grow, that's how we evolve, that's where our great philosophers have come from and have educated us. So, in terms of that right to freedom of speech, absolutely it should be protected. But remember, in having the discussion, 
discussion about the freedom of, uh, of speech, you also have to talk about the responsibilities that come along with that. And that is where the law does have a place to play in protecting those who will be feel vulnerable. Can I talk, Charlie, about the practicalities of this? Because Police Scotland mm. have vowed to investigate every single hate crime uh, complaint it receives. In the same week, as they said, they would no longer mm. be uh, investigating or attending low-level crime like theft, uh, for example, where there's no CCTV or witnesses. And then those things, we talked a lot about shoplifting and theft, yeah. haven't we? Those are things that really do affect people and are often kind of the starters to greater, further, more serious crimes. Definitely. And that's exactly where the, I think the uh, controversy lies, where you want the police uh, you're tackling the, you know, whether they say it's low-level crime, but actually, if you're a victim of burglary, mm. um, uh, it's a very, very significant crime. And you want the police to be, you know, tackling those kinds of crimes, going after those kinds of criminals, not policing uh, Twitter or X or whatever it is where people have got, you know, an opinion about something, whether it's free speech, whether it's hate speech. Uh, you know, of course, you want to stamp that out and you want the online uh, social media companies to do all that they can to stamp it out, but you don't want the police who uh, are, in terms of a finite resource, you know, mm. policing things that they shouldn't be really focusing on. You want them tackling the crimes that we all care about. Sh Charlie, shall we move on now and talk about the economy? Because, again, mm. this is Rishi Sunak coming into the general election. He says inflation is coming down. It's 3.4%. Now, the Bank of England has chosen to keep interest rates at 5.25%. One person voted for them to, to come down. Um, the, this is the headline in the Daily Mail, rate cuts on the horizon. Horizon. How often have we heard that? Well, um, uh, not often enough. <laughs> I think well, uh, so, you know, some of your, your were you surprised? Suggest... Were you surprised they kept them at five point two five percent? I, I wasn't actually, but um, but I was surprised by the forwardness of the uh, governor of the Bank of England to come yes. out afterwards and give his view to, to effectively say it's coming, um, but um, uh, just just not yet. So he he did more than he's done in previous um, votes to reassure the public and I think to try and um, uh, alleviate probably more conservative-minded people that you know don't worry, this is just to still uh, maintain uh, the plan at the moment. Inflation is coming down, but we don't want to then uh, you know. Uh, see prices go up by cutting interest rates too soon. So we're sticking with it for now. Uh, but I'm, I imagine that uh, as inflation continues to come down, which is, as you said, David, one of the Prime Minister's top five priorities, interest rates will come down. Richard uh, Sunak really needs that as well, doesn't he, uh, really? Because it's all about how people are feeling. The graphs mm. are all fine, aren't mm. they? But it's lived experiences. It's that squeeze on finances. And as we head closer and closer towards an election... Absolutely. The money you've got in your pocket is going to play a big role. Uh, oh, completely. And when we have more food banks than we do McDonald's, you know, that's the reality that, you know, the voter is having to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And, of course, when Rishi Sunak tells us that it's one of his top five mm. priorities to get inflation down, what he doesn't do is acknowledge then, well, if he is, you know, taking credit for bringing inflation down, is he going to take responsibility for when it rose? Um, and in terms of how the um, MPs are now getting this increase in their wages, of course, what we were told was that the nurses and the doctors couldn't get their increase because it would be inflation busting and that mm. shouldn't be allowed to happen and we need to, we need to be careful. But suddenly it's OK for the MPs to get... And, of course, numbers. it's worth remembering that, that, that inflation still at 3.4% means prices are still rising. Mm. Yes, because it's not that things are getting cheaper. No. It's actually just that the rate at which they're rising yeah. is slowing down. And you down can see it in the somewhat. shops, can't you? Everything you buy, particularly in groceries, mm. just the cost of those essential items Talk is astronomical. Chocolate this week, just as we're heading towards <laughs> Easter. <laughs> um, essential items. <laughs> <laughs> I really like... This is a brilliant story on the front of the Times, uh, Paula. Yes. Um, Times Radio did some polling uh, about the recognisability, I've made that word up, you know, whether we actually... I like it. Joe Public <laughs> recognises key figures on the Labour front bench. The stars yeah. of the Labour it's Party. It's a fantastic story, isn't Fiona it? Fiona Wilson. She's... Yeah. Very well known, one of the rising stars. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's a problem. Yeah. The problem is, um, and it's a big problem for Keir in terms of his new government, because she's not actually real. <laughs> uh, so she, we won't be able to physically see her uh, on the front row. Uh, you know, it'll come October. Well, we, don't want to, we don't want to see any of them. <laughs> some, some yeah, so, so that's the issue, yeah. isn't it? The fact is that no one knows who anyone is. Exactly. Um, and, and what a great story, because it goes really to the heart of what 
we expect in terms of a government, what we, we expect in terms of who is going to be, uh, you know, orchestrating where this country moves into, you know, in the next 10 years. And actually, we don't know who these people are. And it's not just Labour, actually, it was Conservatives as well. There was a fictional... Uh... Henry Thorpe, Conservative Minister, better known by, than Claire Coutinho, uh, the yeah. Energy Secretary, who's tip for great things. <laughs> she is, Apart yeah. from that the public don't recognise her, according to this poll. You're, you're absolutely right. She's a, a big ally of Rishi Sunak's and tipped to be a potentially um, uh, the next Leader? Chancellor. Well, the next, certainly the next <laughs> oh. Chancellor, a female <laughs> Chancellor before, uh, uh, before the Tories um, get out. But what I think this goes to the heart of, because we talk about the election all the time, we talk about the election almost being over, uh, and I don't think that's the case, because what this poll basically says is that the public aren't really aware of mm. politics or their politicians at the minute. And until there is a general election that's called, or until uh, 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 Rishi Sunak can obviously you know, deliver on his five priorities and then go to the country, that's when the polls will narrow. That's mm. when the public will be as focused as they can possibly be at election season. And that's where I think you'll see... And that's uh, incredibly optimistic, Charlie, given the <laughs> YouGov poll. The YouGov poll puts Labour at 44, Conservatives at 19, Reform UK at 15, four points behind the Conservatives. That is highly optimistic. Optimistic, isn't it? The polls will narrow. Well, the polls will narrow, um, and uh, but there'll be a clear choice in the next election, whether it's uh, Sakir Starmer as the Prime Minister or Rishi Sunak, and um, not uh, not Mrs Wilson or, or, or Mr Thorpe, um, whoever <laughs> these made-up uh, characters in, in these political parties. But I think it's, when that election comes, the public will focus their minds and uh, it will be a tighter race than what I think is currently old at the minute. Mm. And we've run out of time again. And I keep saying we're going to talk about the Botswana elephants <laughs> arriving in well, Hyde Park, and we haven't story. got time. So you are just going to have to keep watching. <laughs> you certainly <laughs> we'll, are. Uh, thank you very much yes, indeed. We'll do it too. next hour. We will. Paula and Charlie, thank you very much indeed. They'll be back with more papers in just under an hour. You have been getting in touch with your views and opinions throughout the morning, not least of all about that New England football shirt and the changes to the St George's uh, cross. Do you think it should change back uh, to the traditional colours? Uh, David said, would they do the same to America's stars and stripes? And Andy says, this year will be the first time I don't buy a shirt for a tournament. They've made this change without consulting the fans. A boycott then uh, by well, Andy. Well, and also, Peter, I think, Pete, you've got a great point here. If you're English, you have a patriotic duty to boycott the kit. This is the flag of uh, England. This is the St George's flag. It's an abomination, the whole thing. Uh, Catherine says they had no authority to change it and they have definitely caused offence by defacing our flag. That's a very strong word indeed. I hate football and I'm still furious. Julie, simple, just don't buy it. Uh, let us know if you are going to buy it uh, as well. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. We're going to continue discussing that throughout and the program. And very expensive indeed as well. Yes, Sir Keir Starmer's point uh, yesterday that they just need to make it more affordable. Yeah, definitely. Now, also making the headlines this week, an urgent watchdog probe has been launched following a huge payment meltdown and four of the big retail chains in the UK. Greg's, Sainsbury's, McDonald's and Tesco have all been affected by cyber issues, prompting fears this could put shoppers' data at risk. Well, joining us now is security expert Will Geddes. Good morning, Will. Uh, really good to see you. First of all, um, I wonder, and many people around the country are thinking, are these isolated incidents or are they actually linked in some sort of mysterious way? Are there dark forces at play? Well, I don't think there are dark forces in play at this particular time or on this particular sort of series of events. This is a bit of a domino event. And fundamentally, it really comes down to uh, all of them using the same third-party supplier for a payment system. So there are lots of serious questions that need to be raised because we, obviously, as a consumer, need to feel confident that not only are we able to walk into those particular retailers, purchase their products, um, but feel confident that any of our data that we share with them, any whether that be our credit card information or our personal data, is going to be protected in the best possible way. So there's some questions to be asked here. Yeah, I and mean, there are some questions to be asked, not least. Why did supermarkets, uh, McDonald's, Sainsbury's, big, big, big retailers, decide to do a software update on the busiest day of the week oh, well, on a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, um, is, it is one of those so things. So you can understand why people get a bit suspicious and then we get four within a week. Yeah. I mean, it, when let's look at it on a very basic level. Mm. We're, we're, when we have our smartphones, you know, whether it be a, an Apple phone or an Android, we'll get a, a periodic update 
which will tell us we need to update. And quite often it will schedule it for a, a sensible time and it will say, do you want to do it now? And we've all made that mistake where we go, yeah, I'll do it now. And then our phone is rendered useless for the next four or five hours. Or it says, we'll do it overnight. And we've learned from our experiences, and we would hope these big retailers would do the same, that they would do it over a, a silent hours, as we would call it, three o'clock in the morning, where it's highly unlikely that A, it's going to interrupt business, but B, also, it's going to be able to iron out any problems if there are problems. Now, one of the problems with software, and we've seen this many, many times, even on our phones, where we'll see an immediate update, which will follow one update that we've done, which will be because the actual manufacturers or the software developers have gone, ah, we spotted a problem here. So there's a bigger question in terms of resilience. And any company, large, major organization, should have some mm. sort of business continuity plan in place that they're not reliant on one singular technology and they have that ability to make sure that they can maintain that business continuity. So, so what does this do for confidence from the consumer? I think we've all slept walked into this. We're yeah. all using contactless payment systems. It's increased, hasn't it? You can actually spend a lot of money now. Yeah. Very few of us carry cash. And at the end of the day, maybe cash is king. Well, the, this actually affected cash purchases as well, David. So, you know, this was pretty mega in terms of, of the, the falling down and failing that happened in this particular instance. And there'll be some serious questions, no doubt, being asked right now as to what they can do to prevent this happening again. But you touch on a very salient point, which is we're very reliant on our technology now. And one of the biggest concerns for us is that if that technology falls down, I mean, I, I use this as a simple analogy for many people. Could you actually memorize and, and tell me what are the telephone numbers for your three closest friends? And I would say it's probably unlikely that you would know all of them off by heart and from memory. Because we're so reliant on our phones, we'll simply go to our phone for that number. So, again, that reliance is so heavy on technology, and it has to be to a certain extent, that when we have major organisations that let us down, um, this loses consumer confidence. Yeah, and, and that, that is key, isn't it? Because, you know, the suspicion was, and you're saying that there weren't dark forces at, at play here, but, you know, Moscow was coming after our sausage rolls. And, and this is also, <laughs> you know, a week where we have had this explosion in conspiracy theories yes. around mm, the Princess yeah. of Wales. Yeah. And, you know, was it a body double in the video at Windsor, for example? Where are these conspiracy theories coming from? Because are there actually dark forces at play here? Because, you know, there's no doubt this is destabilising, isn't it, to one of our national institutions? Well, Sarah, I'd, I'd, I'd give them certainly, the, you know, these four organisations, I'd give them credit for the fact that their media, uh, their communications departments were very, very quick in getting statements out. Uh, well, so, so that's a very key point in what we're talking important. about with yeah. the royals here, isn't yeah, it? I An mean, information void. Yes, I mean, certainly in terms, I mean, having dealt with many risk and threat situations, one of the things that I've always advised main boards or teams of executives or the crisis management team will be to get information out as accurately as you possibly can and as quickly as you can. Because with social media, and certainly we look at X, you know, formerly known as Twitter, you know, conspiracies will run wild. Mm. And, I mean, when we look at the royal family right now, their management of this particular situation around Kate Middleton, I don't think it's been but handled But are they individual well. conspiracy theorists or is this more kind of troll factories, bot farms in Russia, in... Saudi, whatever. It, it's, it's both. I mean, it's a combination. We look at, obviously, the, the announcement through Russian media only a couple of days ago about uh, King the Charles King, being dead. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, it's a good... We, 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 we can't necessarily believe what we read on social and, media. And that's the problem, isn't it? Because yeah. we can't believe what we read, and yet we have the general election coming up. We have elections all over the world, actually. Indeed, yeah. So this is going to be a big problem, trying to disentangle what's real and what isn't real. Well, certainly with the general elections, David, you're absolutely right. We, we have a situation where we have already seen Russia and China actively getting involved into trying to sway and to pervert and deviate, obviously, an understanding of what is happening in the elections, what certain key people are doing. Now, with the introduction of uh, AI, in the induction or, or introduction of deep fake, you know, mm. we're, we're, we're getting into this much more foggy world mm. where we can't necessarily believe not only what we read, but what we see. Yeah, absolutely right. Fascinating uh, stuff and a little bit frightening too. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, security expert Will Geddes, thank you very much. Indeed, plenty more still to come, including the sport with Sam Ellard. Yeah, a great night for Wales. They are one step closer to the European Championships. Uh, meanwhile, Leicester, the latest club to be charged with breaking financial fair play rules. And people 
They're upset with the new England football kit. Will Nike explain the changes? Or ever maybe even change it back? I'll have the latest. This is Talk Today. A very good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you know. laughs> Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is coming up to 10 to 8. Wales are now one game away from another major tournament after the Dragons demolished Finland 4-1 last night. Yes, now joining us uh, with more on that is Talk Sports' Sam Ellard. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, My favourite part of the programme. Oh, no, no, it is. Absolutely. It's my favourite part, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, right, so shall we start, then, uh, with Wales? Tell, tell us everything. So, essentially, we've now got, from last night, two games away they are from reaching the European Championships in Germany. Essentially, last night was a playoff semi-final. They beat Finland. I don't really think anybody thought that would be any problem. Finland, I don't know if we've got many, you know, Finland people listening to the show. If if, if we do... Finland pe Finnish Finnish people. Finnish people. Finnish Finnish. Finnish people. Sorry, Finland. I, I didn't want to say Finnish. It didn't sound right. If we do, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend you, but they're not very yeah. good at football. Right. Uh, Wales, Wales had no finished problems. off the Finns. Wales, um, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I would be impressed, but Jeremy made that joke yesterday oh. so, as we looked ahead to it. But yeah, no problem for Wales last night. They won 4-1. Um, Finland ranked 60th in the in the rankings, and it was it was an easy win for Wales. But Tuesday night now is the big game because Poland last night they beat Estonia 5-1. So on Tuesday night in Cardiff, it's quite simple. 5-1. Yeah, I know. Can you believe it? That's it's Wales. Impressive. It's Poland. 
Winners go to Germany at the European Championships. The losers don't go and probably go to Ibiza or Dubai <laughs> for their summer holidays. I don't know. Um, one place separates the two sides in the, uh, in the rankings. So there's not a great deal in it. Poland are a very, very good team. Quite an experienced team. But I think the real advantage here for Wales is it's going to be in Wales at home. A raucous atmosphere in Cardiff. Um, I always think at these major tournaments, I always like it when we've got more home nations there. Uh, some people are like, no, nah, we don't want Wales there, we don't want Scotland there. I like it. Scotland are there, I want Wales there. I think it adds to the drama, the excitement. They travel well, Wales, all being well Tuesday night, they beat Poland. And if they do, we'll see them in Germany. Let's talk yeah, about another brilliant. home nation. I'm sure you've got plenty to say, Sam, about the new England uh, kits. Well, I know you guys have been discussing having yeah, you on, yeah. on your show all, yeah. all morning. For me, I really, really don't understand why they've done this. I, I think in football... I think we like tradition. I think we like values. And I don't think we like... I mean, that for me, when I look at that picture straight away, it just doesn't look right. When I look at what should be... It doesn't look be, like a flag. Well, no, it looks like a corporate logo, doesn't it? Absolutely. I just think, why do sometimes these men... I mean, they say they've tried to... They're aiming it at the... Uh, Honouring the, the classic um, colour of the, of the training kit from the 1966 side that obviously won the World Cup. So, you know, we should say they haven't just randomly plucked Come out on, three colours. that's colours. a massive stretch. I know it's a stretch. That's the reason they're saying... I don't know why they're trying to be too clever. People want tradition. They want what they know, what they like. It should be red and white. Why overcomplicate things? These kits are expensive enough. It doesn't look right. It looks wrong. And for me, it's just really, really silly. And that's the point Keir Starmer made uh, last yeah. night, wasn't it? Is A, it's horrible. And B, <laughs> it's too expensive. I mean, and also the prices as well. I mean, yeah. goodness yeah. gracious me. And there'll be some people out there who will buy the kit, mm. they'll buy the kit for their two young lads. I mean, we're talking over mm. 100 quid. And here. of course, it's they all shambles. want the latest kit. Uh, well, when I was a kid, you know, every single year, for the start of the new football season, you want the new Arben Liverpool fans, you want the new Liverpool yeah. kit. As I've got a little bit older, I go away from that. But absolutely right. You've got two or three young lads. Mm. I've got two boys, and so they, I can't hand them down because it's the old kit. They're not yeah. interested anymore. No, no, I don't know. They want no, the new absolutely. one, but maybe they won't want so, that. So Lots is, of people is there any they're sense that Nike it. might recall no. this? Why? No, 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 no. Well, from what I think, but the from backlash what, has been enormous. From what I read this morning in the FA at night, they're both very, very insisting on they're not going to change it back. But yeah, they said the that about been, Mary Earp's shirt, though, didn't they? That's true. That's true. That's true. And also, and, and that, that's a good point. And we have seen in the past with things when people on social media go on something mm. and they go, they go, they go. And it was and a boycott people, that brought yeah, that and, change. And people start and it hurts. It hits them in the pockets, and people don't buy the kit. Then maybe. And actually, many people have been calling in or messaging in saying it's patriotic duty not to buy it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You just keep it simple. Red and white. Mm. That's England, right? Mm. Simple as that. Uh, Leicester City, latest club. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> FFP. Charged by the Premier League. Yeah, it's so boring. FFP. Financial the fair play financial rules. Financial fair those. play rules, yeah. which is, um, yeah, it's all in place to stop teams spending more than they generate. I'll be honest with you, I find so this so... So it's a points so... deduction. So it will be a points deduction, yeah. So essentially, uh, this comes from the three-year period where they were in the Premier League. Right now, Leicester are playing in the Championship, but they have been charged with breaching FFP rules um, from when they were in the Premier League. This will be the third team just this season that are going to be, um, well, be dock points. We've seen Everton earlier so, on the so season. So why is this? Because they spent too much money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, it works across the three-year period, three periods, and the whole point of FFP is to top, stop teams from spending more money yeah. than what they generate, essentially. So it's, I think it's a £110 million across three years. If you go above that, you get charged for FFP. And less than now in the Championship, but yeah, they're so going to be charged for the they're three not in years. The Premier so League if they get, there's a very, very good chance they'll get promoted to the Premier League this season. If they do, they'll then get docked the points from next season at the start of the Premier League. But the whole point with this FFP, though, guys, is it's become so confusing, so murky. Mm. Like, we've got Manchester City, who have been charged, they deny it, I should say, but they've been charged 115 cases of FFP. I know, 115, oh. and yet we wait. We wait, we wait, we wait for this to be here, to, for this to be sorted out. Whereas what, Everton, what, what, Forest... What's the delay? Good question. I've got, I think the delay is, is how many charges there are and trying to get through all these delays. But it is, but, 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 but it is an absolute shambles. Mm. How Everton, six points, done. Forest, four points, done. Leicester, done. And Manchester City, we still wait and we wait and we wait. How and, is and it so possible? What, happen, what happens in terms of the psyche of those clubs if they're sitting there waiting and wondering if they're going to get points deducted? In terms of Everton and... Well, yeah. any club that's well, sitting there with, with the cloud, well, the, that dark and cloud this, hanging over you. And this, and this is another point about Everton, by the way. So they've been docked some points already this season. This, this should be the biggest shambles of them all. Mm. There's another... Uh, th they could be docked more points, right? And we don't know yet when those points are going to be docked. Mm. So it could happen at the end of the season. Which, so the season could finish... They could get dog points and that could move them down yeah. into relegation. Yeah. That's not football. No. Football shouldn't be judged on, on off the pitch, should it? It should be judged on the football pitch. Yeah. Not I on agree the boardroom. Completely. Wow. 
You heard it here. Sam's just about to yeah. screw up his I, paper. I, Look I, at him. He's got his paper. He's like, like, he's like I'm I, done. I'm out. I was going to say, I think Set you're very passionate point. about that, yeah. Sam. Uh, I should talk about football on this show. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, Sam Allard, as always, fabulous always to have pleasure. you with us. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Still to come on the programme, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will return to Israel today, pushing America's demand for a ceasefire in the conflict. We'll have more on that next. We certainly will. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Friday the 22nd of March. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. The US on a peace mission. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel today as he pushes for a sustained and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. A playful update or a woke agenda. Sir Keir Starmer blasts England's new football kit over a multicoloured redesign of the St George's Cross. And the search continues. The family of missing British woman, Sam Heslop, call on President Biden to find her after she disappeared at sea in 2021. We'll speak to her friend this hour. And we'll see plenty of blustery showers this weekend. And it's getting colder, just when we thought spring really was here. All the details coming up. How joyful. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Joe. And now, though, it's time for the headlines with Miranda. 
Good morning. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visits Israel today and says there must be an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza. Foreign editor for Jewish News Yotam Kofino says a ceasefire would be conditional on the release of some of the remaining captives taken by Hamas in its attack on Israel on October the 7th. It is a sign that the United States is also growing tired of this situation and that it's now trying single-handedly to, to, um, to enforce a ceasefire. But we have to remember that even if the United States Security Council uh, votes and agrees on, agrees on this resolution, it doesn't mean that Hamas and Israel will abide by it. It comes as witnesses said Israeli forces had escalated their operation around Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, carrying out a number of airstrikes. Footage released by Hamas military wing shows fighters targeting Israeli tanks around the area. Researchers looking to create the world's first lung cancer jab have been given up to £1.7 million, £1 million pounds in funding. Scientists are using similar technology that created the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. The cash from cancer charities is to develop lung vax, which aims to kill cancer cells. The Home Secretary has vowed to crack down on spiking, as he said perpetrators will be held to account by changes in the law. Legislation in England and Wales is being changed to make it clear it's a crime. The most recent figures show more than 500 spiking offences are reported every month involving food, drink, needles and modified vapes. What we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls and the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. Sakir Starmer has told The Sun he thinks Nike should recall England's official kit for Euro 2024. He's called on the sports manufacturer to switch the multicolour flag back to the original one, adding that the hefty price tag could also do with being reduced. And a 270-million-year-old amphibian species has been named after Kermit the Frog. Scientists in the US looked at the remains of an inch-long fossilised skull with large and oval-shaped eye sockets. They say they've called the creature Kermitops gratus because Kermit is a modern-day amphibian icon. Well, those are the headlines for now. I'll have another update for you in an hour. <laughs> Kermit Top Stratus. I'm still not seeing it. No, I can't see it either. I've looked and looked and looked. There is absolutely no resemblance whatsoever between that fossil and Kermit. Uh, lots of you getting in touch uh, this morning. We're talking about the number of migrants coming across. Yesterday, we saw 500 across the English Channel. That brings it up to uh, 4,043 this year. That is higher than at this point last year. At this point last year, it was 3,683. Rishi Sunak says he's going to stop the boats. Do you think he will actually stop the boats? Uh, email us talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talk.tv. Also, you can text the word talk and your message uh, to 8722. Uh, Rob has got in touch and said Labour and the Tories talk a good game but have delivered nothing. Uh, and Tim says the Conservative Party is to blame for the migrant crisis. They stopped processing applications and deporting people and here we are. It's made to stay hatred and get votes. Uh, James says this is what you get with weak leadership. The government should be able to change the law, but the establishment is trying to stand in the way. It's a really good point. We've got the safety of Rwanda bill going through at the moment. We're now in a state of ping pong where the amendments go back between uh, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And of course, now we have we pause. It's Easter. So uh, what happens uh, remains anyone's a guess. Let's move on though, now, though, to our top story this morning. The US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has begun a tour of the Middle East, holding talks with Arab leaders in Saudi Arabia in a bid to secure a ceasefire in Gaza. Joining us now is Professor Paul Rogers from the University of Bradford. Good morning to you, Paul. Uh, Antony Blinken talking about the, the two sides getting closer together. What hope do you have of peace now or even some form of a ceasefire? It is possible that we get a short pause uh, but frankly, I think it's pretty unlikely. Um, the rhetoric coming from the United States has certainly increased a lot. Uh, and they're basically, they're really telling Israel that it must uh, have some sort of ceasefire. But the United States has the capability uh, to tell Israel to do it and almost force it to. 
because Israel is so dependent on American military aid. The U.S. is not prepared to do that at present, primarily for electoral reasons. And meanwhile, Netanyahu does think he can continue. So, yes, there's a small chance, but I think it's pretty remote. As things stand, uh, this war could last many months or even longer than that. Hamas has survived so far. It's proving much more resilient than the Israelis expected. And also, the Israelis are simultaneously finding that their reserve troops are just having to go back to their jobs at times. They need more troops to safeguard the border with the Lebanon. And there are problems on the West Bank as well. So overall, uh, I think it's highly unlikely that the Israelis will go for a ceasefire of any length of time at the present time. It's really interesting you, you mentioned political reasons, because last month the US vetoed a UN Security Council resolution calling for that ceasefire. I wonder how much of this actually is domestic politics at play in the United States, particularly the Democratic voter base saying, we want to see an end to this, this cannot continue. I think, I think you're spot on there. Biden basically has had a long-term historic support for Israel. It goes right back to his meeting with Gordon Mayer just before the Yom Kippur Ramadan War in 1973. So he has this personal commitment. But at the same time, the electoral situation in the United States is, is getting pretty dodgy for him. And essentially, on the Republican side, particularly with a lot of support from the Christian Zionists, who people tend to forget about, Israel has huge support there. So if Biden really puts very heavy pressure on Israel, even though many people say that is essential, it will cost him in electoral terms in the United States. And of course, we're almost into the full period of the campaigning for the November elections. At some stage, I think the pressure will get too high, even for Biden, and essentially the plug will be pulled. We have the extraordinary situation at the moment of the, Israel, of the American Navy sending three large auxiliary ships the army sending five smaller ships to build this wharf in Gaza to get supplies in, so you get a lot more supplies in. But at the same time, the Americans are supplying all the bombs with which the Israelis are actually killing people in, in Gaza. It's an incredible situation, and one hopes at some stage that sense will prevail. But at the moment, it isn't prevailing on either side, and Israel is determined, if it can, to continue with the war in its present form. We are, though, seeing a, a shift in the, in the rhetoric, certainly a, yeah. a much tougher language coming out of, of America now, an increasing frustration uh, with the Israelis, as you say, not at the point of, of withholding arms. But that is something that is being uh, threatened by the UK, isn't it? David Cameron, uh, with some strong language uh, this week about Israel preventing aid getting into Gaza and saying that the UK could cut off Israeli arms supplies unless that aid will get through. Is that going to make any difference? difference, that threat? It's curious. I mean, Britain normally is not a big player in the world. We like to think we are, but we're not. On this particular case, uh, the British probably do have more influence than they realise with Washington. Because if its closest ally starts saying, we're going to have to change how we do things as far as Israel is concerned, that will have an impact. Uh, it depends very much on how far Cameron would go and how far the government would go. Uh, Britain has a very close relationship with Israel. It's supporting the war in all kinds of ways. RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus is a major hub for supplies going into and personnel going into Israel. Uh, and the UK rarely does have this actual clout. It's not prepared to use it. And of course, the Labour Party. Oh, I think we've uh, we've lost you there. Uh, just we'll try and rejoin Professor Paul Rogers there at the University of Bradford. But clearly, uh, this is an ongoing situation. Just to tell you where we are, there is a potential deal on offer. Uh, we believe from Blinken, the Palestinian Authority would be put back into Gaza. If you remember, that is contrary to Netanyahu's wishes. All the parties, including Israel, would commit to pursuing a two-state solution. And this is the crucial bit that Saudi Arabia would normalise relationships with Israel. In return, they would get access to nuclear... Uh nuclear-based uh, civilian nuclear power program backed by America and also advanced US weapons. That, so, yeah, a, a, a UN, big deal. Yeah, that UN Security Council uh, resolution at vote later on today with the US for the first time calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, we'll be following that throughout the day on the channel. Uh, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages, though, now. And The Times reports that one million more people have blamed mental health battles as a reason for being long-term sick, making it the leading cause of disability in working age adults. Pay them what they're owed, demands the Mirror, as the paper says women left out of pocket by pension age rises 
must get payouts. And Kit hits the fans, blasts the sun as the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, slams the New England football strip, not only for the alterations to the St George's Cross, but for the high price tag too. And sticking with that topic now, there has been widespread outrage at what Nike is calling a playful update to the cross of St George on the New England football kit. Speaking on The Sun's new politics show, Never Mind the Ballots, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer thinks the kit maker got it wrong. Um, and the flag is used by everybody. It is a unified, it doesn't need to be changed. We just need to be proud of it. So I think they should just reconsider this and change it back. All right. I'm not even sure they can properly explain, explain why well, they thought they needed to change in the first place. Well, we're joined now uh, by former Home Office Minister Norman Baker. Um, Norman, is, is this the right uh, battle for Sir Keir Starmer to be fighting? I mean, it's a pretty popular one, isn't it, for him to engage with and try and show uh, the real man that he is? Well, it's certainly popular, and he's right in what he says. There's no reason to change the flag. It's slightly... Uh, obnoxious, actually, to suggest we should change it. And it reminds me of when Mrs Thatcher famously covered up the uh, tail spin, the tail flag, rather, of uh, the British Airways um, plane, which had been redesigned, and she wanted the Union Jack back on it, and uh, that had to come back in due course. But look, I mean, Keir Starmer's doing this for one reason, and one reason only, which is that he wants to wrap himself in the flag and say, I'm not Jeremy Corbyn, that's why he's saying it. He happens to be right, however. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, really, that Nike is defending its decision, saying, oh, it's based on a training kit back in the day. I think that's stretching it somewhat, don't you? Here it is, the training kit, uh, which, which uh, dates back some time. 1966. I cannot see <laughs> any resemblance between that and, what, uh, and the abomination on the back of the England football shirt. Can you? No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fa feeble excuse, and they're desperately scratching around for some justification for what's being done. Uh, the best thing that Nike can do is say, we got it wrong uh, and pull it now without causing further controversy. I mean, it's interesting, of course, he was talking there about football, trying to put himself forward as the man of the people. But now, on the issue of stopping the boats, Keir Starmer had this to say on Harry Cole's Never Mind the Ballots last night. Wait for it, it's coming. <laughs> We haven't got it. We haven't got sounds it. Like it sounds, sounds uh, like he said nothing. Well, well, ju he said, just in he terms said he of that. would stop the boats. He, he said he would stop the boats. We know that Rishi Sunak has made it one of his five pledges to stop the boats, and yet 500 people came in yesterday. We've now got 4,000 that have come in to this country. This is what Keir Starmer said last night. If mm. I was the Prime Minister, I'd be knocking on the doors of our European leaders, say, we need to crack this with a joint task force to crack and break these gangs. So we have to do that. Uh, but you think you know, that, that will solve well, it? Contrast that with Rwanda, because Rwanda, mm. um, at the very most, is going to remove about 300 people. If the planes were going, you'd There are 130,000 people. So the mm. chance of anyone... Yesterday, I think, we had a record number for this yeah. year crossing the channel. So the idea that the Rwanda scheme is putting them off is quite hard to make. Those people have got something like a 99.5% chance of never being on the plane. That isn't a very good deterrent so to my mind. That grounding, isn't the flights get going, you, you, you would ground them. Every, just, single, yes no? every single person on the, on the flight, if there is a flight, 300, is going to cost the taxpayer £2 million. It's expensive. I think it's but, an expensive gimmick. I don't think it will work. I would do the hard yards, more mundane, I accept, of actually taking the gangs down in the first place that are running this show. I mean, Rwanda continuing to be a significant challenge is an understatement for uh, Rishi Sunak, isn't it, Norman Baker? But actually, in some ways, in the short term, the numbers coming over, 514 uh, on one day on Wednesday uh, this week, does that actually give him more ammunition? Because we heard James Cleverly yesterday saying, look, you can see the urgency about this. This is exactly what Rwanda is designed to do, to stop uh, those boats. And it's Labour who are preventing this. It's Labour who are putting obstacles in our path. Well, that's simply not true to me. I'm not a Labour Party supporter, but that's simply not true. I mean, look, 514 people arrived on boats on March the 20th. That's more than Rwanda intends to take in a year. So the idea that this is a solution to the problem is simply fantasy. Um, the solution is partly, as Keir Starmer actually says, is dealing with the gangs on the other side of the channel, it's partly about what well, the government did get right. They got one thing right, which they got to deal with Albania, to return people to Albania, and that's cut dramatically the number of people coming from that particular country. So more of those sorts of deals for people coming from countries which are safe 
and they can be safely returned, needs to be pursued. The other thing the Home Office has lamentably failed to do has been to process people quickly. There's, there's a backlog of people waiting to be processed. It's a, it's, a, it's a disgrace, and the Home Office has failed lamentably. That's why these bills for hotels and everything else are, are, are racking up, because they haven't actually dealt with these people. They haven't said yes or no to them. But, but, but to be fair to the government, they have actually given France 500 million quid. They signed the Frontex deal. They are trying to deal with this at source. Isn't the problem here that the illegal migration bill went through, but we have nowhere to send them? That's the whole point of Rwanda, isn't it? And I think many people around the country will welcome asylum seekers being put into uh, places like Wethersfield and Scampton and so on, even though it costs more, because it's meant to act as a deterrent. Also, it stops the death of town centres? I don't think it's a deterrent. I mean, the chance of, the, of people being uh, actually returned anywhere at all is quite remote. And of course, um, Scampton, you, re you referred to that, it's going to cost £46 million more than people put, putting people in hotels. And the cost of people sending people out to Rwanda, uh, Keir Starmer says £2 million. It's £1.8 million, I actually think, is the, is the correct figure. But you can actually get someone on a virgin intergalactic flight for less than that. I mean, the government is spending money hand over fist, our money. You know, the Home Secretary went out to Rwanda on a private jet, £165,000, thank you. But, but Norman, what, 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 what should the government do for those people who have had their asylum applications turned down? Where do they send them? Well, the point is most of them haven't had them turned down because the government hasn't gone around to processing them. But when they have them processed, if they are deemed to have no reason to be here, they need to be returned to the country from where they came because, by definition, that will be a safe country. If the, if the country they come from is not safe, for example, Afghanistan, they need to be incorporated into society and when they can start paying taxes and working towards uh, contributing to this country. One of those two things should happen. At the moment, they're costing people money, costing us money. They're not actually being returned anywhere. They're not working. It doesn't do them any good as individuals. It doesn't do this country any good. Does so anyone have more a plan, Norman? Can do a great deal to sort things out. Does anyone have a plan to deal with it? Well, I've indicated to you a couple of areas where we could make significant progress. One is dealing with the gangs across the channel. Uh, one is getting the processing going much more speedily. And uh, one is coming to individual bilateral deals with countries where it's safe to return people, as the government did with Albania. Those three things together could reduce the problem significantly. But Rishi Sunak has said the legacy backlog has been cleared. Clearly, there is a huge backlog still to be processed. But also, they are trying to talk to all of these countries. But it's not just the UK that is suffering. So, for example, Italy had 127,000 uh, migrants uh, going into Italy last year. This is a pan-European problem. Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, the backlog hasn't been cleared. Rishi Sunak has set an arbitrary date and says that behind that uh, is being cleared, but it's not being cleared at all. There are huge numbers of people waiting to be processed. But yes, I mean, what we have to understand in this country is that this is a problem which, as you rightly say, is pan-European. And in fact, Britain is even far fewer migrants, although people don't feel that way, than countries like Italy and Greece, which are, which are suffering huge amounts because geographically they're closer to the countries where people are leaving. Uh, Norman Baker, former Home Office Minister, thank you very much. Always good to hear from you. Uh, still to come, Channel 4 apologised to an employee affected by the Russell Brand allegations and actor Hugh Bonneville allegedly joins exclusive dating app Raya after being in, despite being in another relationship. Shocking. Former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley and barrister Paula Roan Adrian take us through the papers. That's next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry 
has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.23. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Hugh Bonneville has been spotted on exclusive dating app Rhea, despite being in a relationship with a Canadian actress. That's in the papers next. A pair of iconic snow leopards have arrived at Chester Zoo, the first in their 93-year history. We'll be there live with them at 8.40. I can't wait for that one. And at 9.15, <laughs> Labour's Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury joins us to discuss what Labour describes as a dramatic collapse in crimes being solved under the Tories. But first of all, Joe, it's spring. Is it going to be warm? No, it's <laughs> spring, it's the weekend, the weather's going to be horrible. Uh, not just horrible, but cold as well. We've had lovely warm temperatures in the last week, 18 degrees plus at times, but no, close to normal over the weekend. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, the unsettled conditions are going to continue, as indeed they have done all this week and will do next week as well. This weekend, it's the turn of this area of low pressure. That's going to give us plentiful showers. And uh, although that moves away on Sunday, it's simply replaced by another low pressure system, which then becomes very convoluted, breaking up until we've got two centres of those lows. And you can see much of Western Europe is suffering with these uh, very changeable conditions. So as far as today is concerned, we've seen rain moving south. And this rain is going to take quite a long time to clear. It'll be fairly late in the day before it eventually gets away from the far southeast. So dull grey and damp in those areas. Elsewhere, we're looking at sunny spells and showers. Those showers turning wintry over the high ground of Scotland. Elsewhere, we could see some fairly significant downpours, the risk of some hail mixed in, also some thunder, and it will feel very cold. Temperatures over northern parts will be lower than they have been, around 8 or 9 degrees Celsius, and with that, we've got these strong, even gale-force winds, so a significant wind chill to that as well. It will be mild in the south, still looking at around 11 or 12 degrees Celsius, uh, and it will be breezy in these areas. The wind's not particularly picking up just yet. So as we go through this evening and overnight, those showers just continue. They're coming from this northwesterly direction, so pretty chilly overnight. Temperatures low enough for a frost, although only sheltered areas are likely to see one uh, where they don't see so much of the breeze. And then as we go through Saturday from the off, 
sunny spells and showers. Those showers are becoming widespread and uh, it will feel bitterly cold. Even though temperatures in the south reach around 11 or 12 degrees Celsius, it'll feel like about 5 degrees Celsius in those winds. Still wintry up over the high ground of Scotland, but also turning wintry over the northern parts of the Pennines, also uh, parts of the Welsh mountains as well. As I say, temperatures in single figures for many, perhaps just reaching around 10 degrees Celsius down in the south. So it's going to be a pretty unsettled start to the weekend. Things will brighten up a little bit on Sunday. The wind's easing, the shower's easing, uh, but then it becomes more unsettled again on Monday. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Joe. Time to take a final look through this morning's papers now with barrister Paula Rowan Adrian and former Conservative advisor Charlie Rowley. Uh, morning to you both again. Uh, Charlie, to the mail now, and this is a, a story. David Cameron facing questions about whether the UK is going soft on China and whether it's all his doing. That's absolutely right. And there's an indefinite pause on sanctioning uh, of uh, either Chinese companies or individuals, um, uh, which took place in November. These are leaked documents that Ian Duncan Smith, a uh, Conservative MP, who's been very, very keen uh, to be tough on China and calls out the UK government to being tough on, on, on the UK government's stance on it. Um, uh, effectively, Coming into place in November, this is when David Cameron returned to the Cabinet as Foreign Secretary, so uh, conspiracy theorists will put two and two together and get five. Um, but I think things, a lot th things happen a lot more uh, slower, in slower time than just David Cameron coming in and saying, let's just pause these, these sanctions on China. But it does go back to David Cameron's era as Prime Minister, where he wanted a golden era, a golden opportunity. Rolling out it the was, red carpet. Yeah, yeah, it was him and Oswald, ties. wasn't it, saying that we need to have this golden era of relationships with China. And of course, no one really considered the implications of that. Exactly so. And we've seen since that time, obviously, um, uh, human rights abuses uh, in China. Um, uh, we've seen um, an increase in their uh, in intelligence gathering and, uh, you know, those, those air balloons that go up and sort yeah. of, you know, spy balloons that, you know, they are increasing uh, and, it, and they are an ever increasing threat on the global economy and in terms of security, which is why Ian Duncan Smith has been so concerned. So, so Paula, um, David Cameron is increasingly everywhere, I think, in terms of Israel, for example, China, uh, there is possibly a leadership contest taking place. Is David Cameron What's in the run? <laughs> well, so I mean, there I may well that. Penny Morden is up there, but uh, David I'm, Cameron... I'm there with my sword. Could, could, could David Cameron be, be the leader of the Conservatives? Um, do you know what? Anything, <laughs> anyone could be the leader of the Conservative Party at the moment. Um, anyone, does anyone want to? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there's so much talent. There's so much talent there. That's a very good anyone question. Anyone could do it. Although I heard that their, you know, that their salary is going up. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm in for it. You're, you're right. OK, uh, Paula, let's move on now yes. to this story, which is in the Times, page 11. Channel 4 apologises over brand complaint. What's that about? Yeah, so we need to be careful with this story and read behind the headlines, mm. because what this story is actually about is an employee of Channel 4 who has raised a complaint in terms of alleged behaviour by Russell Brand. Um, and it was how Channel 4 managed that complaint. And there seems to be an acceptance now by Channel 4 that they didn't manage that complaint appropriately. And so it's a shout out really to all employers, be very careful when you receive a complaint and how you address that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so certainly the broadcaster launched an inquiry after this joint investigation by The Times and The Sunday Times. These were allegations, accusations of rape, sexual assault and emotional abuse. So very mm. serious. Very indeed. serious allegations. Um, and, of course, very complex, aren't they? And what you are having to do as an employer is to take those allegations very seriously. Um, and we saw this, didn't we, mm. at ITV, um, that there was an issue there raised in terms of what people knew or what they didn't know um, in relation to uh, Philip Schofield, whether it was appropriate, inappropriate, etc. And there was an investigation then. So it's really important for employers in terms of their duties to their employees to ensure that they are compliant with their own contract of employment and paying attention to if their employee is suggesting, I'm suffering harm, how are you going to address that? Um, Charlie, shall we have a look at The Telegraph? Mm. Um, and this is pupil absenteeism from school, particularly in the summer term. 
Exactly so, and it's um, a record number of people have missed at least half of their summer term. Uh, that's about that's one. That's huge. It is. It's about one in fifty kids. That's not the just country. taking one holiday, is it? You know, out of no out of the, the the prescribed holiday it, times. It, exactly, it's weeks, and you know there has to be a huge question asked as to why these kids uh, are, are not in school. Well, why are they? Well, um, uh, the government's done all it can to try and increase fines for parents for trying to keep yeah. them in school, but um, uh, it can be a combination of. Uh, people trying to have holidays outside of that normal timetable because it's cheaper, it might be more cost-effective. Um, uh, kids are not going back to school because of COVID still. There is still an issue uh, around um, uh, people's not wanting to be in the classroom, just like people don't want to be in, in the workplace. People wanting to be in the classroom or parents not wanting their, people, their children to be in the classroom. Thinking that school is a flexible option. I think that's probably true, yes. I think but, but Paula, surely, how do we turn this around so that people realise that having a free education in this country is a great thing and we need to embrace that? And actually, this is the way that you prosper. That's how generations change, so that you actually move up. You, you then get a better career than your parents, which I'm sure is the aspiration for most families. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I think as well... The suggestion that somehow the parents are to blame for this, I think we're sidestepping the issue here. The issue is, how is it that we encourage and support families who are clearly struggling to get their children to engage once more with the education system? I, I, I don't think this is about simply children going on holidays, no. you know, parents trying to get a cheap holiday for their kids. There are much deeper rooted Absolutely. problems that, that are causes for, for this absenteeism. It's Absolutely. not just a, a because, cheaper flight. Yeah, the, these statistics tell us that it's not just a simple, you know, knee-jerk response to, oh, I can't be bothered to wake my child up to go to school in the morning. Um, let's move on, if we can. This is a really interesting story, That's isn't amazing. it? This is about yes. Pete McCleave. Uh, yes. This is about stem cells. He's unable to find a stem cell donor because he comes from a really interesting minority ethnic background. Yes. And now you look at, uh, at Pete, um, who has set up this campaign. He's launched his campaign to get people to register. Mm. Um, and you look at Pete and... You know, sadly, he found out that he was suffering with uh, a particular type of cancer that meant that he would need stem cell, um, uh, stem cell uh, medication. Uh, and he goes along to the doctors and they say, and they look at him and they say, don't worry, Pete, you'll be fine because you're white European, yeah. no problem, 72% chance of success in terms of us being able to identify a donor. And of course, when they then do uh, Pete's DNA and understand what his heritage is, they discover that um, his heritage is Chinese, that his heritage is Portuguese, Irish and English. And <laughs> that means that it's going to be incredibly oh. difficult for him actually to get this stem cell research. And what Pete did was he didn't just sit back and accept that he has been given this seven-year mm. life term, mm. essentially. Um, he created this campaign because so many people are affected, not just people who look like me, mm. which is the mm. assumption, but so many people are going to be affected by um, not being able to find a donor in, you know, and to assist them in, when they need them so desperately in circumstances like this. So I congratulate Pete and I wish him all the best and hope, hope he does find someone. Fascinating story. Um, really quickly on uh, the uh, dating app, Rhea, Hugh Bonner do you want to go out with me in the sun, uh, Charlie? <laughs> is it really him? Let's see what they've done there. Let's see what they've done. Um, he is, but he's only on there looking for friendship. He, um, apparently, that's his sort of tagline. That's tag what line. they all it's, say. It's, it's, it's twenty pounds a month. Apparently, this celebrity. Are you uh, familiar with dating. Raya? I'm, uh, well... <laughs> I'm, 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 he never called me back. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's move on. Uh, Paul, Paula, yes. shall we talk about elephants yes. in Hyde Park? Yes, elephants in Hyde Park. We've got uh, Botswana uh, suggesting that they're going to send us 10,000 elephants um, because, uh, as far as they're concerned, we do not understand that actually hunting and trophy hunting, something that we find deplorable in this mm. country, is actually something that is very necessary in countries like Botswana, who are being overrun by elephants. We've got elephants killing children, elephants trampling mm. over farms, etc. And how to manage that elephant population is the trophy hunting. And it's great for tourism for them. They make money yeah, out of but, it. But there's a, big prop there's a big difference, isn't there, between culling... Yeah. And trophy hunting, because trophy hunting is someone, as you say, Paula, coming and spending an awful lot of money to go back and, and, you know, be able to brag about whatever 
big game they've managed to kill. So and the it statement is would terrible. be there'd be hundreds of elephants in the middle of central London. I mean, that would be quite a spectacle. Yeah, so if this bill comes through, we're being told that we will be sent these 10,000 elephants. <laughs> and I wonder, just generally speaking, if they want to speak to Rishi about the whole kind of transportation of these elephants, because I hear that there's a Rwanda bill going through the House of Lords, and I know that we've been struggling mm. with, you know, transport ourselves, so I don't know, <laughs> maybe getting 10,000 elephants, they could help Rishi out getting some you know, getting some people to Rwanda. Well, they could certainly trumpet the policy, oh. couldn't they? Could sort of be a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it's quite an extraordinary story, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I mean, they make the comparison with Scottish stags and the yes. cull on deer in Scotland, and they're saying it's just the same. Mm. I would yeah. say trophy hunting versus culling, vastly mm. different mm. in trophy terms is of their... Yes. Yeah. 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 OK. Um, we haven't got any more time for more, but we did finally get to the elephants. We Thank did. you very much <laughs> indeed. Uh, Paula, Rowan, Adrian and uh, Charlie Rowley. And from elephants to snow leopards now, for the first time in its 93-year history, Chester Zoo has welcomed a beautiful pair of snow leopards called Yashin and Nubra, who are just 18 months old. Well, uh, we have actually sent our reporter, Jake Robson, to see them for his very self this morning. Uh, Jake, is it feeding time yet? Absolutely, we've been looked after fantastically. No, but that's, that's not what you meant at all, of course, is it? No, you, you join me exactly in Chester Zoo. I'm actually in the caves where the snow leopards are currently, they're actually just having a little lie down behind me. And, and as you might be able to see in a, in, a, in a few moments, out over to my right-hand side is this vast expanse of space that has been uh, built for the two that have been brought over. Uh, you don't want to hear any more from me. You want to hear from the mammals curator here, Mark Bradshaw. Mark, thank you very much for talking to us. Just exactly how did this come about? Good morning. Um, we've wanted snow leopards here at Chester Zoo for quite a long time now. This is actually in our 93-year history, first time we've had snow leopards here, so it's uh, very exciting for us. Uh, they've come to us from two other zoos, uh, one in Scotland, Highland Wildlife Park, one in Germany, Crayfeld, came over last week. They're settling in well. Very exciting times. Open up today for our visitors, and we're really looking forward to showing them off and this wonderful habitat. And just, yeah, talk us through a bit, a bit of it. You were telling me plenty of rocks been been gone in to building it as well, and uh, temperature controlled as well in parts. That's correct. So we've used about 600 tonnes of rock actually in this exhibit, and primarily to recreate their home. They come from the Himalayas up into Central Asia, and very mountainous areas. So uh, we started with a, quite a flat bit of land actually, uh, probably not ideal. So we've had to build that up, create this sort of mountainous environment. And yes, so we have caves where visitors can see them that we've actually, because they come from, you know, mountainous habitats and colder climes rather than normally we're trying to heat our habitats for our animals because they come from tropical areas slightly different here so we've actually got air conditioning here so we're actually chilling it down for them to provide them with a very comfortable space to be who'd have thought up here it wouldn't be cold enough that's true yes but uh, well it, it, it'll warm up in the summertime and, and just sort of serious for a sec explain then why this is actually really important for, for these animals to, to bring them over here and, and look after them well, snow leopards are vulnerable to extinction. There's only, despite having this huge range across uh, Himalayas and Central Asia, there's only estimated to be about 3,500 mature individuals. So you can imagine that they're very diverse, uh, sorry, very dispersed. Mm -hmm. To such an extent, they're actually, they've earned the moniker, the ghost of the mountains, because they're rarely spotted. So very rare. So things like the breeding program we have here in collaboration with other zoos, very important as an assurance population. And we also support a, a trust out in Kyrgyzstan, the Snow Leopard Trust, and we're helping those with the sort of local communities who might be affected by snow leopards to build alternative livelihoods, so working out in the field as well. And you're hoping maybe there could be a couple more on the way at some point soon? Hopefully. Well, not. and these they are two or 18 months old. They're teenagers, basically. Exactly the right time to bring them here when they'd sort of naturally be dispersing from their parents. But uh, another year or so, we're hoping the sort of hormones start to, to flow a little bit. And yes, potentially, you know, a few years' time, a couple of years' time, then yes, that's why they're here. They're here to, to breed. So very confident we'll have some smaller snow leopards at some point in the future. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for talking to us. That's Mark there, who is the mammals curator here at Chester Zoo. They say, of course, a leopard, sometimes they're not sure whether they can change its spots. That's always up for debate. What's certainly not up for debate is that the two are very much here now.
Oh, wonderful stuff, Jake. Thank you very much. Jake Robson there at Chester Zoo. Lots of you getting in contact about many of the stories that we're covering this morning. Talking about the Princess of Wales uh, <laughs> earlier with Afia Hagen. Um, just in terms of uh, the way they've managed this, uh, Pete says privacy was asked for and it should be respected. The royal family should not have to explain this. It is absolutely ridiculous. Jenny said, and, and she sort of reiterates what I said, they said she wouldn't be seen until Easter. It's not Easter yet, so leave her be. Chris, though, says our taxes go towards their living and travel and private education for their kids. They're entitled to some privacy, especially the kids. But when people are being taxed more and more, they're OK to ask about the royal family. Keith says they should make some kind of announcement if all is well, but they're remaining silent. I think that's why so many are worried. I think there's two schools here, aren't there? There are the people who are genuinely concerned and there are people who want to spread mischief mm. and also make themselves a big profile from it because mm. these conspiracy theorists are getting a lot of clicks. They certainly are around the world as well. Also, we've been talking about the IT outages at many stores, including Greg's. Um, and this just shows, I suppose, whether we should uh, actually be reliant on contactless payments, whether we need cash. Many of you co commenting on that. Technology, Cam says, was supposed to make everything simpler and easier, but instead it's made life more complicated and more stressful. Uh, Luke uh, echoes that sentiment. There is far too much faith in technology that always crashes and is never secure, yet year on year we put more reliance on modern technology. Sylvia actually experienced this two weeks ago. She said she went to Sainsbury's, the system crashed and I couldn't pay with my card. Went to the nearest cash point, system also down. I'm keeping cash in my wallet at now. So that's the lesson she's learned. Yeah, and I've started to do the same. Well, still to come, wow. three years after her mysterious disappearance, Sam Heslop's mother is calling on President Biden to help her find her daughter. We're going to be talking to two people very close to the case next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have moved another on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.45. The family of a British woman who has been missing for three years in the US Virgin Islands are pleading for help from President Biden to find her. Sam Heslop was living what seemed to be her dream life when she disappeared from her then-boyfriend Ryan Bain's catamaran in March 2021. Well, joining us now is close friend of Sam, Andrew Baldwin, alongside former Met Police Commander David Johnson. Andrew, let's start with you. Can you just tell us more detail about what happened exactly and the lengths that you've gone to to try and find the truth of what has happened? Yeah, well, firstly, good morning and thank you for having us this morning. Um, three years ago on the 8th of March, uh, Sam went missing uh, in the Caribbean. She was uh, living on a yacht and working on a yacht with her boyfriend, uh, Ryan Bain. Uh, and it, 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, she allegedly went missing. Uh, Mr. Bain uh, reported it to the police that she had gone missing and then um, failed to report it to the Coast Guard for nine hours, uh, allegedly inferring that Sam had fallen off of the boat. Um, over the last three years, we've been working tirelessly to understand what happened to Sam, um, what happened that night uh, for a thorough investigation and to, to just understand uh, what, what's happened to our friend and, and hopefully get her back. And, and David, you have uh, assisted uh, the family with trying uh, to get some answers. What, what's your assessment of the way in which the investigation into this has been handled? Hey, good morning. Um, poorly. It's been handled poorly by the island police and I make no bones about that. Um, as you mentioned in, in, in the outset, my background is as the commander of homicide at Scotland Yard. I've been involved in hundreds of homicide investigations over uh, three decades or more. Um, the situation where two people uh, are living or uh, on board a boat a couple of hundred metres uh, off the shore in very calm surroundings, both of whom are familiar with the boat, um, Sarm was an ex uh, air stewardess who could swim. She was a fit young lady. Um, there are only a couple of hypotheses that can relate to her uh, untimely disappearance from a boat at 2.30 in the morning. Uh, she either fell overboard and hit her head and was unable um, to shout out. That's, in my view, highly improbable and highly unlikely, although it is a hypothesis. Um, secondly, that um, she chose to leave voluntarily. Uh, which again is highly unlikely given that her personal belongings were remaining on the boat uh, and given her background and association with her family and friends, it's completely out of character for Sam to disappear of her own accord. Which leaves us with the last, that perhaps a second party was involved and there was a row or something happened on that boat that led to Sam uh, being harmed and losing her life. And that's a hypothesis that still has never been properly uh, investigated. In fact, it hasn't been investigated at all. And that's uh, where Bain, that, that was know. what I was coming to. So you've got this nine hours that are unaccounted for, but also in terms of the interview process, as far as I understand, he hasn't actually, Mr. Bain has never been formally interviewed by police or indeed forensic analysis of, of the boat hasn't been carried out. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, the boat was not detained. Uh, Ryan Bain, we are told, allowed the Coast Guard to have a cursory look at the boat, but refused them access to the cabin of the boat, and the cabin of the boat and the boat was never properly examined or searched, nor has there been any forensic activity conducted on that boat, uh, and indeed, nor has there been any forensic activity against Mr Bain's phone or the technical devices on the boat to see where the boat may have moved to or what may have occurred between 10 p.m. or 10.30 p.m. when we know Sarm returned to the boat on a dinghy with Mr. Bain. Um, and it's just ludicrous. I mean, had this been in the United Kingdom or elsewhere, Mr. Bain would have been detained and that boat would have been searched. Of that, I am categorically clear. And it is just... It's, it, it's just incredible that the island police did not take the action of this being somebody missing with the possibility that they may be uh, missing and dead. 
in circumstances like this, if you don't take that opportunity at the beginning, then you lose the golden hours of the opportunity to trace witnesses and collect evidence. And indeed, if you don't try to collect evidence, then you won't have any. Yeah, now we should say uh, a lawyer for uh, Ryan Bain has said uh, that he had nothing to do with Sam's disappearance. He's heartbroken that Sam uh, went missing. The Coast Guard was twice on the vessel conducting a search and questioning Ryan. They had unfettered access to the vessel and Ryan answered all the questions posed to him. But, but you there, uh, David, talking about the, the police and the failings of the, the police investigation. But what are the impacts of this, uh, Andrew, on... Sam's family on mm. her mum, who has no answers and, and is unable to grieve still. The impact is just immeasurable on her family, on her friends. Um, Sam was a, a, a person who lit up a room. She was a, a shining light that was loved and is loved by all her friends and her family. And I think it's been said it's it's the not knowing um for her mum her dad and all her friends it's it's a not knowing it's the not being able to grieve for her will she ever come back it's the questions that that we all have in our head where when you go to sleep at night that says well, you know is she there is she out there somewhere and and we just need to we just need to find her mm -hmm. and and that's what uh referring back to david we'll, we'll never know we 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 pretty much lost the first 24 hours of the investigation Whatever the investigation is, we're still struggling to understand uh, what investigation has and hasn't taken place three years later. And those first 24 hours, which were critical, um, we will never be able to get those 24 hours back. And if those 24 hours had gone a different way, we may not be sitting here today. And you know, those are the things that I think keep us all awake at night. And, and David, what do we know about Ryan Bain and his background? Well, can I just come back to a point about his lawyer? I completely agree. We don't know whether Mr Bain was responsible for Sarm's uh, death or, or ultimate disappearance. His lawyer has indicated that Mr Bain, if legally required to do so, would return to the islands to be interviewed. Mr Bain, I would appeal to you, it's not about your legal requirement, it's the morally right thing to do for the family. Mr Bain cut Sarm's family off on social media two or three days after her disappearance. That doesn't sound like a heartbroken boyfriend to me. So, Mr Bain, do the right thing. And he also... Uh, the other issue... Sorry, uh, j just tell us a little bit about his past history as well. Well, so we're aware from uh, open source information and inquiries we've made, uh, Corey Stevens, uh, Stevenson, his ex-wife, uh, has told us that he was a man predisposed towards mercurial violence towards women. He assaulted her and served jail time. We understand there may be another lady who has come forward who says she was in an abusive relationship with Mr Bain. So there are a series of events there in relation to Mr Bain's past which just don't seem to fit with the grieving boyfriend. We know that immediately after he was allowed to sail off into the sunset in his catamaran siren song, Inquiries I've had made abroad indicate that he later changed the name of that boat to Orion's Belt with a view to trying to distance himself from the adverse media regarding Sarm's disappearance. And we understand that he took the boat to Grenada where he had part of the cockpit refitted and possibly a replacement of a large fridge freezer on the boat. We don't know whether that was routine maintenance or what the reason behind it, but you can understand the suspicion that that, that, that raises to, to the family when nobody has bothered to formally interview him about any of these events or to pursue those uh, lines of inquiry. I mean, his, his lawyer, as, as we said, just uh, reiterating that he says he had absolutely nothing to do with Sam's disappearance, that he did uh, cooperate, but absolutely uh, devastating uh, for uh, the family uh, of uh, Sam, uh, those lack of questions and pleading with the US administration, the Biden administration, mm. uh, to get involved. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Andrew Baldwin, a friend of Sam Heslop and former Metropolitan Police Commander David Johnson. Well, still to come, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will return to Israel today, pushing America's demand for a ceasefire in the conflict. More on that next. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We were supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. Good morning. It is coming up to 9 o'clock on Friday, the 22nd of March. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. The US on a peace mission. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrives in Israel today as he pushes for a sustained and immediate ceasefire in Gaza. A playful update or a woke agenda. Sir Keir Starmer blasts England's new football kit over a multicoloured redesign of the St George's Cross. And Labour's crackdown on crime. Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury joins us this hour as she lays out how the party will work alongside the police if they're elected. We should see some brighter skies over the weekend. Unfortunately, with the sunshine comes an awful lot of blustery showers and it's going to feel very chilly as well. All the details coming up. What joy. Thanks very much indeed, Joe. Now, though, it's time for your headlines with Miranda. Good morning. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visits Israel today and says there must be an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza. Foreign editor for Jewish News, Yotam Kofino, says a ceasefire would be conditional on the release of some of the remaining captives taken by Hamas in its attack on Israel on October the 7th. The United States is also growing tired of this situation and that it's now trying single-handedly to, to, um, to enforce the ceasefire. But we have to remember that even if the United States Security Council uh, votes and agrees on, agrees on this resolution, it doesn't mean that Hamas and Israel will abide by it. 
Well, it comes as witnesses said Israeli forces had escalated their operation around Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, carrying out a number of airstrikes. Footage released by Hamas military wing shows fighters targeting Israeli tanks around the area. Researchers looking to create the world's first lung cancer jab have been given up to £1.7 million in funding. Scientists are using similar technology that created the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. The cash from cancer charities is to develop lung vax, which aims to kill cancer cells. The Home Secretary has vowed to crack down on spiking, as he said perpetrators will be held to account by changes in the law. Legislation in England and Wales is being changed to make it clear it's a crime. The most recent figures show more than 500 spiking offences are reported every month involving food, drink, needles and modified vapes. What we're doing is we're updating the legislation to make it clear and unambiguous that spiking is a crime. We prioritise the prevention of uh, crimes against women and girls and the people who perpetrate spiking will be held to account. Sakia Starmer has told The Sun he thinks Nike should recall England's official kit for Euro 2024. He's called on the sports manufacturer to switch the multicolour flag back to the original one, adding that the hefty price tag could also do with being reduced. And Chester Zoo says it's hopeful two new snow leopards will go on to have cubs. It's the first time in the zoo's 93-year history that its carnivore experts have ever cared for the highly threatened big cats. The pair has moved into a brand new home that's been purposely built using more than 600 tonnes of rocks to recreate the rocky terrain of the Himalayan mountains. Well, those are the headlines. I'll have more for you in an update, an update in an hour. Super. Thank you very much indeed, Miranda. Now, our top story this morning, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has begun a tour of the Middle East, holding talks with Arab leaders in Saudi Arabia in a bid to secure a ceasefire in Gaza. Joining us now is former Conservative MP and Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth. Uh, Sir Gerald, good morning to you. Uh, Antony Blinken talking about the two sides getting closer. Uh, what do you think is the likelihood of a ceasefire being achieved? Well, good morning, uh, great Dr. Bull and Sarah. Nice to uh, be speaking to you. This, of course, is a really serious matter. And I'm not particularly hopeful that there will be a satisfactory outcome, partly because I think Israel set itself an impossible target in the first place. The idea that they were ever going to be able to eliminate Hamas was for the birds. And all they have done, I'm afraid, is just to pound Gaza and therefore make potentially far more recruits for. Hamas. And I think that uh, uh, President Netanyahu, Netanyahu is uh, under immense pressure at home. I think that much will depend upon how strongly those who say that he should prioritize the release of the hostages above all else may determine how Israel responds to the call for a ceasefire. But uh, we have seen such calls have been uh, uh, rejected in the past, and in the uh, the initial stages, I was not in favour of a ceasefire. I felt that it was necessary for Hamas to be dealt with, but notwithstanding that I always thought that it was uh, an impossible target they had set themselves. But my final point, Sarah, is that I think that the Arab world has got to take a real responsibility for this. They've known Hamas has been uh, had taken over Gaza in 2008. They have allowed them to run the place, to build all the tunnels, sometimes with, uh, with Arab money, and to launch repeated attacks on Israel. So I do think this is an Arab world uh, issue which they must address. We have got to prioritize Ukraine and Russia. There is a far more immediate threat to us. That is what we've got to do. Uh, Gerald, let me let me just move on and talk about Keir Starmer now, if we can. He's positioned himself as a man of the law. But how uh, did you think he did when uh, Harry Cole interrogated his history of defending terrorists last night on Never Mind the Ballot? Sorry, repeat that, uh, uh, David. So, so Keir Starmer that. did an interview last night with, with Harry Cole. I think we've got a clip of it we can just show you. Uh, this is a, a show called Never Mind the Ballot. Essentially, Starmer was asked why he had defended terrorists in the past. 
Al Fawez, Al Qaeda spokesman in the UK, wanted in the US for helping to plot with bin Laden. So, you you tried to stop him being extradited. You're giving different examples. The principle is exactly the same. No man. regrets. Lawyer gives legal you've advice. Never, it never looks. You never. Heads hit the pillow one night. You've never thought. Oh, I wish I hadn't done that one. Well, look. Lawyers represent clients. Doctors um, treat patients. The, the fact a doctor p treats a patient doesn't mean the doctor agrees with what the patient's mm. beliefs are. What do you make of that, Gerald? I mean, here, here Keir Starmer is trying to put himself as the man of the people. He is obviously trying to position himself as prime minister in waiting. And yet the public will look at that and think, well, you supported or represented terrorists in the past. I think that's absolutely right. I think when it does come to the election, uh, I think the British public will recognise that Sir Keir Starmer is no Tony Blair, but he does have uh, a past which is deeply tr troubling. Uh, he was always uh, free to reject the brief to support uh, uh, the terrorists. And he was also uh, free to uh, uh, resile from Jeremy Corbyn's government. But he was a cheerleader for Jeremy Corbyn, probably the most left-wing person that we have had putting up for the leadership of our country. And that is where Keir Starmer comes from. So all this endeavour to show that he's a man of the people. And I happen to agree with him about the uh, uh, the England shirt. Also, at 120 quid, I think it's an outrageous amount of money. Uh, but I think he happens to be right a, 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 about that. Uh, but these are much more serious issues as to where he does actually stand. We have seen him flip-flop over a whole series of issues uh, since he became leader of the Labour Party. Um, and I'm certainly not accusing him of, of, of supporting terrorism, and that, that would be uh, outrageous. But he does have to explain to people if he wants their support. When we face all these very serious challenges around the world and particularly close to our shores, he has got to explain to the British people where he exactly he does stand, why he supported Jeremy uh, Corbyn, why he did not say, this is a man up with which I cannot put. He said he never and... thought they had a chance in 2019, didn't he, uh, Sir Gerald? But, I mean, on the question of the shirt, um, it's, it's trying to show he's a man of the people. And, and let's be fair, he is a committed football fan as well. He's, he's talking at this as a football uh, fan. But why do you think Nike have done this? Are we ashamed of the England flag? Sarah, that is a very, very good question. Nike is not a British company. So I believe it's an American company. If you violate the flag in America, you face very serious penalties. They attach massive importance to the flag, uh, partly because they do not have a sovereign now. Uh, they are deprived, mm -hmm. uh, unlike us, who have the benefit of uh, formerly Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II and now His Majesty King Charles III. They don't have any such thing, so they have to revere their flag. There's no way you do that with the uh, the stars and stripes. And I do think it's it's extremely offensive. The flag of St. George is perfectly clear. It flies from most churches uh, in, in England. And it is one which we, uh, we see regularly at, at every England football match. So why on earth uh, tamper with it in this way? So on this, I do happen to agree with Sakir with him, of course, I was a parliamentary colleague uh, uh, some time ago. So I agree with him on that. But um, the question has to be asked of Nike, well, what on earth they're doing? And I agree with this, Sir, Sir Keir. They should bin it and bring back the flag of St George so that the England fans can rejoice in seeing the flag of St George uh, as it heads towards the, uh, the opposition goalposts. Uh, Sir Gerald, we have spoken about the fact the general election is fast approaching. Rishi Sunak has made Stop the Boats one of those five pillars. And yet we saw over 500 people come across the channel yesterday. It stands the total at 4,043. At this time last year, it was lower. It was 3,683. We've seen this nonsense of the illegal migration bill, the safety of Rwanda bill, now in that ridiculous process of ping pong, which you know very well indeed. And yet no no one has been deported, and that is what people will judge the Conservative Party on come the election and when they are alone with a ballot paper. Uh, David, you're absolutely right. This is the, the key issue for 
uh, most British people. It is uh, not just the wave of migration that is happening. That's what my mother, in a letter to the Telegraph, uh, 1967, headed Alien Invaders. Uh, it is not just uh, that. It is the scale of it. It's the fact that when the people come here, uh, they then tell us what to do. Our capital city has been uh, uh, has been hijacked weekend after weekend uh, by people not protesting about the brutality of Russia and killing women and children and deporting them uh, from Ukraine to Russia, uh, but something where Britain has a very much more limited uh, role to play in Gaza, largely because that is where many of them came from, or they come, come from the but, Muslim world. But it's world. equally important that the plight of women and children in Gaza, though, isn't it, Sir Gerald? Yes, of course, the plight of women and children in, in, in Gaza is important. But we're talking about the boats here. I'm talking about the people who are coming here. Uh, and, of course, the people who are coming here long preceded. Many of them who came here, or the ones who came here last year, preceded the 7th of October, a brutality committed by ha Hamas uh, on, on the Jewish people. But, Sir Gerald, uh, what, what, the, what, the is the is, what is the answer here? Because we now are seeing this process going back and forward. It's now going to be paused until after Easter. People at home are thinking, what on earth is going on? Why don't we just deport these people? Do we need to leave the ECHR to do that? I personally think we do, to give you a straight answer, David. The European uh, Convention on Human Rights was set up in the aftermath of the Second World War to stop a repetition of the Holocaust. It was not set up to prevent uh, democratically uh, 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 arranged governments like ours. Uh, one of the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council uh, from determining uh, the makeup of our own country. Uh, I think that the policy has failed, and I know that Priti Patel in a pretty extreme way. She worked incredibly hard trying to sort it out. So a problem and tried to sort it out. The truth is that the institutions, and I do also blame the courts, and many of the people opposed to the Rwanda policy are former judges sitting in the House of Lords. And I think their behavior is outrageous. It's not for judges in the House of Lords to determine uh, whether Rwanda is a safe country or not. That is for the elected British government to decide. But to deal with the specific problem of the boats, the answer does not, in my view, lie in simply uh, deporting them to Rwanda, we're seeing the problems there. It, it lies in stopping them coming in the first place. And many people, I suspect, may share my view, seeing the RNLI and the, uh, and, and the border farce uh, picking up uh, uh, migrants, many of whom, of course, have no means of identification because they've thr thrown them away, uh, no, no passports or anything, coming across the channel. Mm. They need to be intercepted on the way of and sent back to France. We paid France hundreds of millions of pounds to strengthen their patrolling of the uh, French uh, coast. We need to send them back and our forces need to be sat there on the median line between uh, France and Britain in the uh, English Channel and turn them back. It's France's problem. France took them in in the first place. France should deal with them, not the United Kingdom. Every attempt to negotiate with France, every attempt to uh, uh, make this uh, asylum, the, the, the reception arrangements for these uh, migrants on, on the bed's work has failed. It's costing the British taxpayer a fortune. I'm involved in a very exciting pro project at Royal Air Force Scampton, the former home of the Dam Busters and the Red Arrows, for a £300 million investment there. It's been stymied because Suella Braverman insisted on putting asylum seekers uh, in the uh, uh, on that base. And it's got to stop, and I'm afraid every other attempt has been made. We need to see the British government. And I think Rishi Sunak, who said stopping the boats is one of his five priorities, he has got now to take the gloves off and say the British people had enough, we're not tolerating this anymore, and they're going to be sent back mid-channel. They are not going to be sent and, back. And, Gerald, well, very, very quickly, if I can just ask you, how do you turn this around? You're only four points ahead of Reform UK, and I would say that, wouldn't I? You would say that, wouldn't you, David? Well, I think it, it, uh, turning it around means providing the British people with an assurance that you mean business. And I don't doubt that uh, Rishi Sunak means business on the boats. The truth is, though, that it is not working. And I think, therefore, if he wants to uh, uh, be able to outstrip reform, then he needs to be able to show that he's taking firm action that works. And I don't think anybody... Any reasonable person, of course, all the lawyers and the uh, Islingtonians yeah. will all object, but I don't think the, the, okay. the, the vast bulk of the British people will object if 
He says, I am not going to be stymied by the Sir European Gerald? Convention on Human Rights. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are out of time. Uh, Sir Gerald Howarth, former Conservative MP and Defence Minister, thank you very much indeed. Still to come here on Talk Today, the Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury reveals how Labour plans to crack down on crime if elected. The time is 9.14. This is Talk Today. Do stay with us. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the Statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 9.18, returning to politics now. And according to Labour, over 90% of crimes now go unsolved. That's according to a new report from their Charging Commission, which is out today. They say bureaucracy and inconsistent case files prepared by the police lead to victims abandoning the legal process at a near record rate. And they believe 1.6 million dropped out last year alone. We can now ask Labour's Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury all about this. And a lot of this comes down to a lack of communication, uh, Emily, between the police and the CPS. How do you resolve that? That's right. I mean, we discovered that the that the charge rate had gone down by two-thirds since 2015. I mean, it's just terrible. And the amount of time it was taking for cases to be charged had trebled. So we had to do something about it. So I asked CPS what the problem was um, in my role as Shadow Attorney General, and Yvette Cooper, in her role as Shadow Home, was asking the police about it. And they were just pointing the fingers at one another. There had been this catastrophic breakdown in communications between CPS and police and lack of trust. Um, so we need to patch it up. And so what we did is that we commissioned some people to get together, experts in the field, to talk about this together and to work out how we can bridge the gaps. And they came up with a number of, of, uh, of different suggestions 
conditions which we've accepted because they're very sensible. It begins with, let's have an annual plan, a joint plan and joint action plan in each area where the senior prosecutor and the senior police officer sit down together and go, right, how are we going to make sure that we charge more people than we are at the moment? And whether that's the quality of the files of evidence that the police are giving to the CPS, which more often than not, they're not adequate, or whether it's the CPS just not answering the phone and not being sufficiently good at communication, whatever the reasons are, they need to sort it out. And they'll have a plan and they'll be inspected on it. So we will be expecting them to implement them, not just to write nice plans, but to actually make a difference. And it all and makes sense, doesn't it? It all sounds things. like a nice plan, but in practical terms, how do you do this? because we're talking about charging domestic yeah. abuse suspects and keeping them in custody yeah. for longer so they're not going home uh, to a partner, for example. That requires space in police custody. And a lot of the reasons for sentencing delay, for example, has actually been about prison overcrowding. How are you going to solve that when we know that the coffers are bare? Yeah, so we've, so we've made the, 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 the first recommendations about making sure they work together and then there are a number of specific things such as if someone is arrested for domestic violence and the police have them in the cells, we're going to do a pilot with the best performing police, police uh, teams where um, if someone is about to, they're against the clock, they're going to have to release them because they haven't charged, they're waiting for the CPS to come back. If that's happening, then the police can charge instead and then a decision can be made about whether they're bailed or not as opposed to simply having to let them out because they haven't, uh, they haven't charged them. So that's, that's one reason. So you asked me a specific, specific question about prisons. Let me tell you this. The, the government have allocated four, million, four, sorry, four billion pounds to spend on, on building more prisons, but they only spent 1.6. Uh, exactly why I don't know but you know the idea that we have run out of prison places and our judges are supposed to make decisions about what the most appropriate sentence for someone is based not on what's appropriate for the crime or what the victim should should expect or how we protect the community but instead on the basis of oh we don't have any prison places is outrageous okay and so you know we have made it clear that we would spend that money because the because the courts need to make proper decisions will you spend money uh, emily thornbury on compensating the waspy women uh, this is going to be your problem according to the polls uh, if you win the election would you compensate them in full well in fact, it's the government's problem because the government are the ones who are in charge. But you're going you know, to inherit it. If you win the election, whenever that long. might come, you're going to inherit this bill. But the, but the Ombudsman has come out with its decision now. He's, we've been waiting five years. The Waspy women wave placards saying we need fair and fast justice. The only people who can give them fast justice is this current government. OK, they if they need don't, to and you come into power the report, in the come autumn. next week and make a decision. If they don't and you come into power and in the autumn and these women the haven't been compensated, no, no, no. will we're... you pay them in full? I'll show you the headline on the front of the mirror, pay them what they're owed. Does Labour agree? And if you were in power now, would you be paying them what they owed? And will you come the election? See, what I'm saying is that we're not going to get in the way of this. We're holding the government to account on this. They're the ones who should be making the decisions. But, but They're you the ones may well be the government and that's budgets. why I'm asking to and hold you to account. And it isn't just this. And it isn't... I mean... And it's, and, it's, and it's a series of other ones. It's also Horizon, you know, the postmasters. What's, what are the government blood. going to do about that in terms of compensation? Contaminated blood, mm -hmm. child abuse, you know, one thing after another. And they are trying to duck a decision. We are not going to allow them to do that. We expect them to come back next week and tell us what it is that they intend to do and whether they're going to be either compensating these, these poor women and or they're going to be also making sure that Whitehall never makes a mistake like this again but let's be it realistic about it the, these things they haven't have been resolved to stay yet in power and they haven't been resolved well, yet have they I mean, and it's not likely that the government's going to come back next week and give you those answers I, I know i know what you're saying that you want those answers well, why not? But i'm just why being, not? yeah i'm why not, not the government they, they're the ones but, who are insisting well, on remaining in government what I'm i mean asking, if they called an election for may it would be a different matter, but they want to hang on to power for another nine months. They've got to get okay. on and govern, haven't so, they? So if they'd called an election for May and you would be inheriting these bills, would Labour be paying them in full? They didn't call an election for May. They insisted <laughs> on remaining in power. That's not answering my question, Therefore, Emily. they have to make the decisions. 
I'm not going to get in their way. I'm not going to let them get involved in some big political game, some sort of argument about all of this. So you are backing full payment no, for the Wasby women? We're, keep, we're standing back. We're standing back and we're saying to the government, you want to be in government? You make the decision. We expect you to be, to be making that decision next week. OK, and we will be asking you the same questions if you win the election. As you say, it didn't happen. It's not happening for May. It is happening in the autumn. It's very simple. Yes, no. If this still has not been resolved, will Labour sort it? On Tuesday or Monday, if the it's government yes, come no. back to yes, Parliament no. <laughs> and make a... Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. And make an announcement, we will then respond to their announcement. But they are the ones in power. They on Tuesday. The it's a yes, no on Tuesday. Emily say. Thornbury will hold you to that. Emily Thornbury, Shadow Attorney General. Thank you very much indeed. That is all from us here on Talk Today. Jeremy and Nicola back on Monday from 6. Yeah, Kev and Alex are up next. Have a lovely weekend. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the pan. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And, yeah, I've just received an email just saying... Um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, 